All right, any questions from any of the previous sections? I'm going to go kind of roll straight from the ID section into the DERM. And then depending on how long that takes, I might go into starting the ENT section. Durham's not too, too long for, for our purposes here. Okay. All right, let's continue on then. We're talking about our uh, antifungal agents. Uh, continue with our echinocandins. Kind of so these are a very good uh, group of drugs for like really kind of invasive fungal infections. We see these used a lot in the inpatient kind of setting, uh, especially if you have, say, like a, a patient with like an opportunistic infection, say they're a you know, cancer patient or something like that, and they get a secondary uh, fungal infection, these are really, really good for treating those kind of more invasive type species. So things, uh, the drugs in this group include uh, caspafungin, mycofungin, and then anidulafungin, which you can just probably say araxis is a lot easier to say. Uh, and these are similarly going to work uh, like a lot of our other type of antifungals, where they're going to be working against the cell wall, right? Because again, we know the cell wall of a fungus is different than the bacteria, which is why we need different types of drugs. And so here, you can see they're going to be working against, uh, let me see if I can pull them right. They're going to be working against uh, this 1,3-beta uh, deglucan synthase. And so basically, they're in, uh, decreasing the amount of, of that 1,3-beta uh, deglucan that's going to be able to inhibit the cell wall from actually functioning, right? So just basically know that these are going to be cell wall inhib inhibitors for funguses, right? So in case, like, you know, a question came up on a test or something, it was like, hey, which one of these drugs works as a cell wall inhibitor for a bacteria? And I had, you know, say, three drugs that were antifungals and one antibacterial, like a penicillin or something. Like, you need to be able to kind of... Uh, uh, focus on those and know which ones are antifungals versus antibacterials, obviously. Um, so these are good for things like esophageal candidiasis. Do uh, you guys know another name for that? I mentioned it previously. Thrush. Yeah, thrush is a good name. So again, this is not just for like a routine kind of like thrush infection that, you know, say like a healthy patient may get. These are going to be for much more um, uh, possibly sick patients because, again, the thing you worry about, say, for a cancer patient who's neutropenic, if they end up getting, um, say, thrush developing, the, they have a higher risk of that going systemic, right, because they don't have a good uh, host immune system. You see more of those, uh, that fungus can, you know, kind of translocate and potentially, you know, get into the bloodstream and, and spread elsewhere. That's one thing we worry about. Also, into the respiratory tract is another big place we worry about uh, funguses getting into. And again, um, you know, I notice here, you know, this thing, uh, febrile and neutropenic patients not responding to antibiotics. Why do you think I include that statement there? So you're treating a patient there, they have febrile neutropenia, um, I'm giving them antibiotics for several days, their fever's not getting any better, um, they're, they're not recovering any better. What, what do you, why would we give an antifungal all of a sudden? Hmm? Yeah, so if, if you're suspecting it's not a bacterial infection, right? So it's one of those things where if I'm constantly giving you a patient uh, who I'm suspecting to be infected with something, I'm giving them antibiotics and they're not improving, that's when we start to think about, especially those immunocompromised patients, um, we start to think about things like fungal infections, right? Certainly there could be other things like viral causes, um, but fungus has to be one of those things that uh, kind of goes on our differential. And um, have you guys heard anything about uh, culturing for funguses? What's the turnaround time on those versus like a bacteria? It's a lot longer, right? So sometimes it can be like a week or two before you get actually like a definitive culture back. Um, so that's why one of those things where, um, you know, do, you know, uh, culturing for bacteria, generally pretty easy. You can get results back within a few days um, as far as like, you know, the you know, culture and sensitivity and all that. Um, getting things for like an anaerobic culture can be more difficult because, again, you have to order those specifically because, you know, if air gets in contact with anaerobes, mm -hmm. they, they don't grow very well. Uh, and then funguses take a long time as well. Another thing you might think about, um, you guys heard of like, you know, mycoplasma, like tuberculosis, things like that. Those also, those uh, mycoplasma tend to take a while to culture as well. So this can be um, one of those things where, you know, culture is pending, but it may be a week or two before you get anything back. So um, some things you can see as far as uh, side effects, uh, pretty well tolerated for the most part we see, but sometimes you can have some electrolyte disturbances. This won't be as nearly as bad as you guys remember the really, like, really bad antifungal we talked about previously, the one we like to avoid. Uh, Amphotericin B. We don't like that one very much because, again, it can cause a lot of renal damage and you can see a lot of electrolyte wasting. This one's going to be much more um, mild than that, for sure, um, but hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia are, are possible here. Uh, this one, griseofulvin, is going to be a very good um, uh, outpatient sort of drug. You're going to probably per be prescribing this uh, with some regularity if you work in the ER, if you work in the urgent care type setting. Um, this is uh, pulled from a... Uh, um, uh, the penicillium, griseofulvum. Um, so you can see there's a lot of natural kind of sources for a lot of these um, drug products, as you'll see. And these are actually working on, on a different mechanism. They're not working on the fungal cell wall necessarily, but certainly they're working by inhibiting these mitotic spindles. And so if we know we're inhibiting the mitotic spindles, those are very useful for doing what? In the dividing bacteria or fungus? Energy not energy production. 
cell division, right? Because again, that's what tells them pull those chromosomes apart. And so similarly uh, to people, we, we see that with, with funguses as well. So in these dermatophytes, if they're not able to divide, that arrests the cell growth. And that's usually going to allow for our host immune system to come in and, and wipe out the rest of the infection. And so, um, you know, you can see this working, especially well in, in a lot of skin, hair, and nail uh, fungal infections. So this is why you'll see these used uh, pretty, pretty, um, pretty commonly. And you'll notice this is the, the treatment time that you're going to be um, utilizing the, these drugs for. And so this is one of the big things to note with uh, fungal treatment, especially for things like, you know, uh, nail infections and things like that. It's very difficult for drugs to really penetrate and kill off those funguses. It's not the same as if it was like, you know, say in the bloodstream or say if it was in, you know, uh, in the esophagus or anything like that. These take a while. And so um, the number one reason why people don't clear these infections is because they stop treatment too early, right? They think, hey, I've been taking this for, you know, a month or so. Things seem like they're getting better. I'm going to go ahead and stop treatment. And then it comes right back with a, with a, um, you know, just the same as it was before, or even worse potentially. Um, so things like scalp infections seem to be pretty easy to treat for the most part. Um, so maybe like a month. And you guys remember we were looking at durations of treatment for like uh, antibiotics. How long are this a typical treatment period? Seven to 10 days, sometimes 14 days, sometimes 21 days in, in some rare instances. But seven to 14 is usually going to be a pretty good treatment for most uh, bacterial infections. Here we're going to see at least one month, you know, for something like a scalp infection. Uh, the fingernails, six to nine months you're going to be treating for, right? So again, patients are going to not, not want to be uh, adherent to that in a lot of cases, or, you know, if they can't afford the drug, that's another problem. And then for the toenail infections, um, this is where you can see up to 12 months treatment, right? To really get rid of those really nasty um type of uh, fungal infections. And so uh, griseofulvin is typically going to be an oral product. So this is better for patients uh, who may be uh, not compliant with, say, using like, some of our topical products, as we'll see here in just a few minutes. So um, this one's very lipid soluble, very good at um, being able to uh, get into those, uh, you know, some kind of far distributed kind of tissues. Um, and you'll see it's effective against a lot of different dermatophytes, but not going to be um, candida, right? So you can't use this for like a thrush infection, but certainly for a lot of like, you know, skin, scalp infections, like these are going to be a lot better uh, drug to use for that. We see that it's lipophilic and it also is going to have increased absorption with a high fat meal. So this is one of those things where you might educate patients, hey, you know, take it with a high fat meal or a glass of milk, you know, whole milk or something like that will help with absorption and get better uh, uh, action of the drug. And we'll see, uh, this is going to be uh, pretty well tolerated for the most part, but one of the big side effects you're going to run into are the adverse uh, potential drug interactions you can run into are going to be this induction of some of these enzymes. So like enzyme CYP1A2 and the 2C family, okay? Um, again, this is not as uh, going to be as big a problematic as like a 3A4 type of induction, but certainly for things like the 2C9 family, that like warfarin is a really big one, the anticoagulant we talked about, that actually gets metabolized by 2C9 and 2C19. And so in this case, if I were to have induction of those enzymes, what would that do to my warfarin levels? Lower them or raise them? It will lower them, right? So if I induce enzymes, what happens to the number of those enzymes? Going up. And then it means there's more of them able to metabolize those drugs, right? Um, so remember, keep that relationship in mind. If I'm inhibiting a CYP enzyme, the effective drug levels are going to go up. If I'm inducing a CYP enzyme, the effective drug levels are going to go down, right? Because there's more enzymes available to, to metabolize there. Okay. All right, next we'll have our allylamines. This is a, a naphtaphene and terbinafine. These are, again, um, you'll see these uh, sometimes used for either uh, topical mm -hmm. products, uh, occasionally orally. Um, this is where I uh, see things like naphtin, or I'm sure you guys have uh, heard of lamisil. A lot of these uh, ones we're going to talk about upcoming are going to be available over the counter, right? So you can see some of these being uh, recommended. You may not have to write a prescription for it, but certainly you may give instructions on, on how to use it. Um, <laughs> So these are going to be really good for things like fingernail infections, toenail infections. And so, again, the, the nice thing about uh, topically applied antifungals is what do you think, uh, um, what are the likelihood of having systemic side effects? Not very high, right? Because, again, we don't see a lot of systemic absorption. Hopefully, they're getting really high concentrations at the site. We're hopefully going to be working um, directly against those uh, this nice little fungus that's growing. Uh, and it's not really going to affect anything else in the body, which is, which is a good, positive thing here. Um, Again, fingernails, you're going to see no, normally is going to be a shorter treatment period than you would see with the toenails, um, either just due to poor circulation or just the fact that, you know, what do you normally have on your feet? Shoes. And that's usually a pretty nice environment uh, for fungus to grow, right? So a nice, sweaty, dark environment, like fungus likes to grow there. So that's why you're going to notice that the toenails uh, tend to have a lot longer treatment duration uh, than the fingernails will. Uh, we'll have tolnaftate, uh, tough actin, tenactin. I'm sure everyone know who the spokesperson for this was for a long time. Tough actin, tenactin. You guys never saw those commercials? I am, yeah, thank you, John Madden. I am woefully out aging you guys. Uh, 
every year it gets worse and worse. It's terrible. Anyway, um, so this is another uh, oral, uh, I'm sorry, uh, topical agent you're going to see used over the counter. Uh, again, for these, um, you know, things like uh, uh, nail infections, most commonly, again, cutaneous mycoses. Um, you can see this is good for a number of different tinea um, species. So again, this can be another a very common over the counter product you may be recommending as a, as a topical product. Okay, so that's it for the, the group of antifungals uh, we've talked about there. Next, we're going to go into our anti-helminthics. Uh, what do you think these are used against? Anything in, in particular type of parasites? <laughs> the worms, yes, the worms we're going to be treating here. Worm infections are pretty gross, but we're going to have a couple of drugs that we're going to use to treat these. Um, the two main ones we're going to have is going to be uh, albendazole and then mobendazole. Um, so these are... Uh, Somewhat commonly, we see these uh, with in, with some regularity in peds. Um, so again, a lot of times, like you know, parents will say, "Hey, you know, my kid, um, I notice uh, in their poop that he's like little worms, things like that." So uh, that's usually the the most common thing we run into, at least on the peds side. Um, basically. What we can do is um, we can use these drugs and actually help um, with the formation of these helminthic microtubules. They also help with blocking glucose uptake. And so if they cannot uh, utilize glucose, they can't generate energy and they die off, right? Um, so this can be used for things like roundworms, hookworms, pinworms, whipworms, all different types of worms. Um, uh, and so this is nice because they're kind of broad spectrum and generally they're pretty well tolerated. It's so not a ton of side effects we're gonna see with it. Uh, maybe some GI upset. And again, if you see rash with that, that would be cause for concern. Again, very rare that you would see something like Stevens-Johnson syndrome or or toxic epidermal necrolysis, but is uh, a theoretical risk. Uh, another drug we'll have is going to be parental pamoy or PINX is the, one of the common brand names there. Uh, this one's actually interesting because it releases acetylcholine, right? So we know acetylcholine is really important for uh, neuromuscular transmission, right? And so we're going to see that's uh, important for the worms as well. And also will inhibit cholinesterase. And so if I inhibit cholinesterase, what does that do to acetylcholine levels? Should increase as well, right? Because that uh, you know breaks down acetylcholine, and so it actually works as a depolarizing neuromuscular blocker, which means that uh, if I increase the amount of acetylcholine affecting, you guys remember if it's muscarinic or nicotinic receptors, nicotinic at the neuromuscular junction. If I overexcite those, it's going to lead to um, uh, activation of those receptors. You're going to see muscular contractions, um, but then eventually it's going to tire those receptors out, and you can see paralysis. Um, so we actually have drugs that work like this for people. We do that for if we need to um, uh, paralyze them for intubation or for doing it for surgery, and we have drugs that work very similarly to that. So if anyone's ever heard of succinylcholine, sure, yeah, so that, that drug works very similar to how this does. Um, but again, specificity is really important here because, again, we don't want to give this to our uh, patients, uh, and then all of a sudden they become paralyzed, right? That wouldn't be very good. Just wanted to work on the worms. But by doing this, again, eventually cause paralysis and, and death of the worm there. Um, these are going to be more used for pinworms and hookworms, so um, less kind of broad spectrum, as you saw with things like albendazole, but still very, very useful here. And again, not a ton of side effects, business headache, you, you pretty well tolerated. Okay, so that concludes our infectious disease section. So the overview, again, we're going to run into these drugs again and again and again as we hit uh, specific uh, organ systems. So we'll talk about these kind of ad nauseum as the course goes on. Any questions? Okay, very good. We're going to continue on. Uh, next, we're going to talk about the dermatology section. All right. So you guys have already started derm and CMS, right? Fantastic. All right, that's you're going to notice that's going to be a lot longer um, section. Like we're probably going to devote maybe like an hour to this section here. Um, so you may one of the concerns that a lot of people had is like, well, why do we only get like an hour of this in farm versus we got like you know several several blocks worth of this in, in CMS. And the fact is, is that a lot of derm stuff you're going to see the same drugs coming up again and again. Um, use basically the same group of drugs. Uh, a lot of corticosteroids we're going to be using. Um, we'll talk about some of the stuff we use for um, things like um, uh, acne uh, pretty extensively. But for the most part, you're using the same drugs over and over again. So I'm not going to talk about every single disease state that comes in the derm section. We're going to talk about the drugs um, that come up there that are going to be most representative of treating some of these disease states. So if you have additional questions, we can talk about it. Um, but for the most part, we're just going to cover the drugs you're going to see in dermatology and then kind of move on from there. Also, have the caveat, I'm not a derm expert. I don't work in derm day in and day out. So someone who does that um, more consistently would probably be able to answer some of the more um, you know, kind of the, the intricacies of using things like, you know, different potency steroids as we're going to see here in just a little bit. But I can at least we can get the basics down. Uh, and if you have questions, we can talk about that. Or I can look stuff up if I need to. So, because again, when in doubt, always look stuff up. Okay, so again, same objectives we had for our previous sections here. All right, so uh, some introduction into dermatologic pharmacology. 
Okay, so again, we're talking uh, a little bit about how we have uh, topical uh, application of a lot of these drugs that we're going to be seeing here. And the benefit is, is that it kind of limits the amount of systemic side effects you see. For the most part, you're going to see there's going to be some limitations to that. And if you're using drugs in specific um, ways, either a specific type of drug or, uh, you know, especially looking at the physiochemical properties of drugs, obviously, you know, if something's more lipophilic, how likely is it to be absorbed into the systemic circulation? More or less likely than something that's say, more hydrophilic. It's going to be more likely, right? So things that are lipophilic tend to be absorbed a lot better than things that are going to be hydrophilic. So that's going to be some of those things we're going to be looking at here. Um, it also depends on where you're applying the drug to. So where do you think drugs get best absorbed from on the body? Hmm? Yeah, thin skin, right? So wherever you have thin skin, you typically are going to have a lot better absorption. So um, things like the scrotum, things like the face, things like the axilla or the scalp are going to tend to be more permeable than you would see, say, like the soles of the feet or the hands or something like that, right? And so that's another really uh, important thing to consider there is that where are you applying these drugs to and what is that going to mean for drug absorption? Okay. Also with concentration gradients are really important here. So you're going to notice that a lot of the topical products we talk about are going to be expressed as percentages. Uh, and so as you increase the percentage of the drug, you're increasing the concentration gradient there from the outside, which is applying it to the skin, to the kind of lower concentration of what's in, in the skin, right? And so the higher the concentration gradient, the better the flux, right? So you guys remember that, um, that fixed law we talked about previously? This is going to come up again when we talk about um, uh, absorptions, right? So the bigger the concentration gradient, the thinner the membrane we're trying to cross, the higher lipophilicity mm -hmm. of the drug we have, all of that's going to increase the uh, ability for the drug to be absorbed systemically, and that leads us to see side effects, right? Because again, a lot of these drugs, when we apply topically, we don't want to see these uh, systemic effects. And so we're going to try to limit that as best we can, uh, as we'll see as we go forward. Okay, um, again, looking at uh, the dosing schedule. So for a lot of these topical drugs, you're going to see that, um, especially if you're hoping to get um, so the you know, condition is very widespread or something like that. It takes a little bit of time for these drugs to kick in because it takes time for that drug to be absorbed into the skin. And so what you see is that the skin can act as a reservoir for drug effects, which we'll see. Um, so we call this a kind of a depot effect, right? So you can have a, a reservoir drug in the skin that can still be absorbed there. This is important um, when we're dealing with things like uh, transdermal drugs where we're hoping for systemic absorption. So things like, I uh, guess, remember the drug I might have mentioned at fentanyl? You guys ever heard of like a duragesic patch or a fentanyl patch? Anyone familiar? It's a very potent opioid um, that we'll sometimes use for patients with chronic pain conditions. But one of the things you see there is you can't just slap a patch on a patient, all of a sudden they feel way better, right? Because that drug hasn't had time to absorb. And so it takes you know roughly 24 hours or so before that really starts to get through and to be absorbed through the skin. And so that's why one of those things where if you had a patient who was say on say an IV drip, of an opioid and you want to transition them over to a transdermal product, you have to start the patch, put them on the patch, and then as that drug starts to get absorbed, then you start to titrate down your IV and then they can switch over to just the patch alone, right? So those are some of the uh, kind of dosing considerations you have to think about. Another drug we'll look at, um, anyone ever been on a cruise and gotten seasick? And whenever you use like a little patch behind their ear for that, that's called a, a transderm scope or, or the drug is uh, the generic is scopolamine. And it's an anticholinergic that really helps with seasickness. The thing is, people always uh, have to be educated is you have to take it. You can't just like walk on the boat, put it on a patch on and all of a sudden you're not going to get seasick. Right. Because the drug hasn't had time to absorb. So I tell you a day or so before the cruise, go ahead and put it on. And then by the time you get onto the boat, all of a sudden you have a drug in your system and hopefully it's going to be working to prevent any seasickness or nausea vomiting from occurring. Right. So there, again, when you look at some of the education points here, this, this is some of the reasons why is to account for these um, the kind of delay in absorption here. And so um, other things you may see is that because the skin will maintain this depot effect, you can see that some of these transdermal products may not be applied very frequently. So some of the patches, for instance, uh, may be applied once every three days or once a week, you know, things like that. Uh, so that can be very useful for helping um, short acting drugs to act for a longer period of time. OK, so that's one thing to consider. And then um, talking about vehicles, when I say vehicles, what do you think I'm, I'm referring to in the drug sense? Yeah, so what are we putting the drug into? So the cream, the gel, the ointment, the lotion, the tincture, whatever we're having to putting it into um, is going to have a, a drastic effect on the ability for the drug to be absorbed and also how well it's going to stick around, right? Um, so if you guys imagine something like um, a lotion, you know, what does your skin feel like after you put a lotion on? A little, little oily, right? So it's not something like, you know, everyone ever slapped like Vaseline on them, right? So how, which one feels more oily? 
Yeah, the Vaseline, right? So we'll see why that is based on whether it's an oil and water emulsion, water and oil emulsion, things like that as we go into. But typically the vehicle, uh, depending on how uh, much it sticks around for, you know, the more oily it is, typically the more greasy it is, it's going to stick around for longer, which means you have better contact time, which means more drug can be uh, at the site to actually work. And then um, we'll see that also, depending on the, the lipophilicity of that, it can affect drug absorption as well, which we'll look at in just a few minutes. Um, also looking at things like moistening or drying effect, you know, so if you're dealing with a patient who say has dermatitis, the skin is very, very dry, um, do you think that absorbs drug better or worse than uh, more moisturized skin? Typically the worse, yeah. So the more hydrated the skin is, the better um, kind of transfer of drug you can have. So usually um, one of the kind of the key rules, my, my sister's a nurse practitioner, she she learned and in, in when she covered dermatology was if it's dry, wet it, and if it's wet, dry it. You know, so that's one of the things we're going to be looking at and choosing the type of vehicle we're going to use. Um, so things like, you know, if you have very um, dry, scaly skin, things like that, sometimes we're going to use more uh, moisturizing type products, things that are going to be much more um, kind of oil-based uh, that can help with that, uh, or more water-based in some cases. Versus if we're having some things that are very, very wet or kind of weeping, we can use things like alcohol based products so that can actually help dry that out based on evaporation. So we'll look at those. Um, and again, sometimes the vehicle itself may be therapeutic. So especially when you think about, um, you know, that kind of dry, scaly skin that gets very uncomfortable, the more moisturizing effect you can apply to that, that's going to like lead to patient uh, comfort anyway. So that can be very useful. And then uh, the question is about occlusion. And when I say occlusion, what does that mean? Yeah, so is, is the, the product covered up? Um, and so what do you think covering up, say, a topically applied product would do to absorption? Increase. Tends to increase it, yeah. So the more occluded a product is, the more absorption you can have. And so a very good example I have, did I ever mention the baby that got um, the wrong diaper cream? Yeah. Right, so that's a really good example of that. So again, remember, the um, for people that don't remember, there's a, a young infant, probably six months old or so, um, had... Uh, diaper rash, mom accidentally grabbed dad's back cream, which is a custom compound and product, it had things like ketamine in it, which is a uh, pretty uh, uh, heavy duty anesthetic agent, um, had things like, you know, uh, antidepressants in it, and you know, all kinds of different products that are mixed in this custom compound. And so kids got nice flush skin, especially after a bath, when it's had, had a warm bath, um, skin's red and raw because it's, you know, nice and um, uh, rashy. And then all of a sudden we're applying cream to that area. And again, which uh, areas did I say are particularly thin? especially the groin, right? And especially babies tend to be a lot more thin skin than adults are, right? And then also now you put a diaper on top of it, a very occlusive type dressing. Um, kids got a ton of absorption. You're able to measure ketamine levels in the system afterwards. Um, kid had very significant um, toxic effects, ended up needing to be intubated, kid did fine, but it goes to illustrate the points of, of how you can affect drug absorption um, when dealing with these products, okay? So um, again, look at the, the uh, dermatologic vehicles, the considerations here, um, how soluble is the drug in the vehicle? A lot of times we pick the vehicle that we're using based on how well the drug gets, uh, gets solubilized in it. Obviously, if the drug is not soluble, say in a, um, a water-based uh, product, um, it's not going to work very well, right? Because it has to be in solution for it to really kind of work. So that's one consideration we have there. And then how well the uh, vehicle can hydrate the stratum corneum is another good thing. So the more hydrating it is, the better the penetration typically we're going to see there. And then the stability. The other big thing is that um, when you're looking at drugs that are being put into a sort of water-based solution, um, one of the big things you worry about is the stability of the drug. And when I say stability, what does that mean? Yeah the, yeah, the time before the drug actually breaks down. And so typically when you put drugs into a water-based solution, they tend to, or they're going to be less stable than they were if they were in uh, like a dry uh, state, right? So again, when you imagine if anyone's ever filled like uh, suspension, antibiotic suspension um, that they pick up from the pharmacy, like usually how good, how long is that good for? like a week or two at most, right? Because once you put the drug in a solution, it tends to become much less stable than if I were to, um, say, just keep it in a tablet form. Usually tablets will have years on their uh, expiration dating versus something in the solution. It tends to be a lot shorter. We can do things like putting preservatives into it. Um, you also have to worry about sterility of the product, meaning, you know, do you have bacteria and stuff growing in it? Um, that can be another concern there. So those are all the things we're gonna be looking at when we're deciding what type of vehicle, or at least drug manufacturers are deciding when they're, they're formulating these products. So looking at um, the type of products we're going to be using, you're going to notice here um, that things that are alcohol-based, so especially things like tinctures, um, tend to be the most drying. And so these are going to be better for things that are like um, oozing, if you have vesiculation or crusting that's happening there, that typically will dry out uh, the wound or the, the affected area. So that's usually can be pretty good for them. Um, as you go down and you get a higher water content, um, where you see things like lotions, gels, um, those are going to tend to be um, 
We've got a little bit more uh, hydrating as you go along. And then as you get down to things like paste, creams, foams, depending on what the formulation is, um, you're going to see that um, they're going to be more hydrating. Things are going to have more oil content in them. They tend to be more hydrating. They stick around for longer. So it's better for like scaling. Um, what's that? Like kinification. Yeah, thickening of the skin, right? So, uh, and this is xerosis. So if you had like, you say, no sweating or something like that, you know, very dry skin, um, these kind of higher water content or higher oil content tend to be better for that. So um, just looking at this, you don't have to memorize um, these numbers specifically, but just when we're kind of comparing different dosage forms, it's good to have an idea of kind of what the differences are between these. So again, across the top here are things like creams, ointments, uh, gels, or foams, and then we're going to have lotions, solutions, and foams here. Um, so again, these are kind of the broad categorizations, probably the most common ones you're going to deal with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis in the, in the clinical setting. So looking at the physical basis here, we're going to see that with creams, um, you're going to have an oil and a water emulsion, right? So it means it's going to have a higher water water content, but there is some oil in there uh, being mixed in, okay, versus something like an ointment. Ointment tends to be a water and oil emulsion, okay, so higher oil content, lower water content, those things. so it's good to keep those in mind. And if you had to think, which one do you think would stick around better on the patient? The, you know, the ointments, yeah, so the higher oil content helps it to stick around better, has higher, liar, um, higher um, uh, staying uh, activity, essentially. When you get into gels and foams, this is where we're going to see these are more water-soluble emulsions, so they tend to be lower on the, the oil content. And then some of these lotions, again, the solution ends up being dissolved um, in the drug base. And then uh, sometimes you're going to see that, uh, depending on the product, if it's like an aerosol or something like that, uh, those tend to be uh, kind of drying depending on what the alcohol content is. So the higher alcohol content, the more drying a product tends to be. Um, so you can see the solubilizing medium, again, looking at the oil and water, higher water content there, right? So again, um, that's why creams typically don't feel as greasy uh, feeling as something like an ointment will, because the ointment is going to have uh, much lower water content, a lot higher um, uh, oil there. And again, which one do you think patients typically prefer? More like greasy feeling or less greasy? Less greasy. Usually less greasy, right? It may not be best for them, but they usually don't like to feel really kind of gross and greasy. And that's why like, I don't, if my hands are really dry, I don't like to use lotions because I don't like the feeling of it afterwards. Um, so again, it just depends on your patient preference and kind of what they're going to tolerate. Um, typically when you get into gels and foams, you may see that these are going to be um, sometimes mixed in other types of solutions. You may see things like polyethylene glycols. Um, this sometimes get uh, shortened to PEG if you ever see that. So those are um, type of alcohol um, type products. And then again, sometimes with your like lotions or aerosols, you may see they may be much more alcohol based in those cases. Um, so if you think about like, um, uh, I guess ever been in the hospital setting and they have those uh, foam um, dispensers the, for sanitation, right? So those are mostly alcohol based. They tend to be pretty drying for the most part. And so that's one of the problems you see with like healthcare providers and they're constantly having to um, use the, um, the alcohol based uh, sanitizer. They get very, very dry skin. You can see cracks and things like that. So oftentimes they may have to revert back to using like soap and water uh, for a period of time. So. And so um, look at the pharmacologic activity. Again, um, you're going to find that uh, with ointments, they leave kind of a protective oil on the skin. So again, they stick around for a good period of time. They can help with um, either drug staying ability or just helping with um, keeping the skin kind of occluded and helping it preventing from getting other things kind of getting in there. Um, usually with the creams, you're going to find that once the water kind of evaporates off, you'll leave behind um, a drug at the skin surface, but not nearly as much staying power as you would see with an ointment. And then with our gels and foams, typically non-staining, uh, greaseless, that's another thing with the oil-based products. You can see sometimes staining of um, clothing and things like that. So that's another thing to, to warn your patients about. Um, so the advantages to the patient uh, with the creams, you're going to see they spread pretty easily, um, usually are removed pretty easily, and they don't really um, have much of a greasy feel to them um, versus uh, like ointments. They typically do have a pretty greasy kind of feel um, being left behind there. Um, things like gels and foams can sometimes be good for scalp uh, application, right? So that way you can kind of get down to the scalp through the hair, which can be very, I imagine trying to put like Vaseline in your hair, it probably wouldn't feel too good. But, you know, things like foams, you know, can be a lot better for that sort of thing. Um, and then some of these, you know, have low residue on the scalp. So again, that may be preferable to your patient. Um, as far as locations on the body, you're going to find that creams can go in most areas um, because they are going to be able to evaporate off. You know, you're not really going to worry about, um, uh, you know, increased drug absorption as, as opposed to when you're dealing with an ointment. So, again, avoid these kind of endogenous areas. Um, typically, they will stick around for a lot longer. You see more drug absorption, more likelihood for having, um, you know, systemic effects and, and things like that you want to worry about. And again, the more water content you have in a product, the more you're worried about bacterial um, uh, growth. And so you need to have things like preserved as they're going to be included in there. Um, so again, any type of water type based product is going to need preservatives. And then um, alcohol bases can dry the skin. So that can be useful if you have more of kind of a um, kind of wet type area you're trying to treat or it's more um, uh, oozing, that, that sort of thing. 
Um, again, disadvantage with the creams, obviously needs uh, preservatives because it does have the high water content. Um, and then with the ointment, again, worry about greasy feel, stain clothes, things like that. So it can be very um, uh, not preferable by the patient. Uh, as far as occlusion goes, again, lower occlusion with the higher the water content because once the water evaporates, the, the vehicle is gone essentially. Versus with the ointment, they're going to have a lot higher occlusion, a lot higher staying ability. And then uh, as far as composition uh, issues, we're not really worried about humectants. Um, that's basically something that helps with um, kind of uh, Kind of blending the drug together with the base and not really worry about that so much but um and then sometimes with the, the ointments we do have to worry about if the product itself is not super dissolvable in the base um, you may see that you need uh, some things like surfactants to help uh, prevent separation of the product right so that's one of the things we'll see if you ever hear the term breaking and emulsion that's usually what it means when the the product the phases separate out so sometimes you'll need additional products don't worry about this uh this section here too much but again the rest of these are kind of good um, rules of thumb to keep in mind when dealing with different drug products or dr different drug vehicles i should say Okay, so moving on, we're going to talk about acne first. Have you guys covered acne at all yet? No. Derm okay, perfect. So hopefully we'll, what we're saying is going to back each other up. Otherwise, we'll talk about any differences we have there. Um, obviously, acne, I'm going to go a little bit over the, the pathophysiology. I'm not going to get into all the details of the epi and all that kind of stuff because, again, you cover that in other places. Um, but I talk about the pathophysiology at least enough um, so that way we can uh, have a good understanding of why we use the drugs that we use uh, and, and any other the kind of the considerations we have there. But when dealing with acne, we know that there's uh, a lot of different factors that go into it. It can include things like dietary factors, environmental factors, um, and lots of sort of uh, things there. The the four main main factors that we're worried about, though, and the things that our drugs are going to be working on include things like increased sebum production, which what is sebum? It's kind of that oil and stuff you're kind of making in your pores. Um, you're going to have altered keratinization process and you're going to have this hyper proliferation of the ductal epidermis right so that's where we're going to start to see some of our um, zits and things like that start to form we'll look at pictures of that in just a minute um, we're going to see bacterial colonization and one of the big bacteria here we're going to see is this propionum bacterium acnes okay so um, anyone know what type of bacteria this is So it's going to be, uh, it's going to have more kind of anaerobic kind of characteristics to it. And so again, when you imagine if you have all this sebum production that's kind of clogging up your pores, you get kind of a nice anaerobic kind of uh, setting where you can have uh, proliferation of these bacteria. So we're going to see that some of our antibiotics are going to be uh, targeted against this one specifically. Yes, it is fall into the um, uh, gram positive category there. And then also you're going to see that when you have uh, proliferation of uh, these bacteria, they're going to cause inflammation. And so your body is going to be responding to that, which is why a lot of these areas tend to get pretty inflamed, right? Because you're going to be um, sending a lot of uh, inflammatory mediators, neutrophils, and things like that are going to be mediating to the area. This is why you get a lot of inflammation there. So um, some of our contributory factors and things that you want to like educate patients about are things like heat and humidity uh, that can induce uh, some of these comedones to form. Um, a lot of times you're dealing with um, uh, either pressure or friction. So again, if you think about like a lot of like, you know, football players uh, who are out, you know, uh, practicing in, in the heat and they have those pads that are rubbing on, they're probably not cleaning them super well. You can see why, you know, potential infections can happen there. Um, Overly excessive scrubbing or washing can predispose them to, to more acne or kind of low uh, hairstyles, so if it's low on the neck or the forehead. Uh, and then it, typically in the seasons, as far as that goes, um, sometimes you'll see improve in the summer, um, a little bit worse in winter. But again, it can depend on the patient, kind of what their, their individual setting is. Um, and some people feel there is some physiologic uh, uh, effects here. So again, um, looking at stress. Uh, if you imagine if you're in a stressed state, your glucocorticoid production goes up. And in glucocorticoids, what does that do to your uh, immune system? typically suppresses it, right? So that means you have more ability for those bacteria to really start to uh, to replicate, and that's why you can see some issues there. So um, one of the problems you'll see with patients who are taking systemic corticosteroids, uh, one of the things you can see is acne to develop there, right? So again, that's one of the, the big things you're going to be seeing, um, and it could be uh, related to that. So again, I tell your patients, maybe don't stress so much. Maybe that'll help with the acne. Uh, or you know, maybe, again, but again it's, it's, a lot of times it's multifactorial. Even though we're using drugs that can affect things like the bacteria and the sebum production and all that, it may not be really affecting uh, some of these other issues like the stress uh, or physio physiologic factors. Okay, so pooling of the sebum is going to create this kind of anaerobic condition. I'll show you a picture of that in a second. But basically, you're going to have proliferation of these propionum bacteria acnes. Um, you're going to have that T cell response that can happen here, which is going to lead to more inflammation. And so as you have um, lipase uh, from the bacteria, actually starts to hydrolyze some of the triglycerides that are there uh, present uh, in the follicles into uh, free fatty acids. This actually helps with the keratinization process, and you're going to see these microcomedones start to form there. Um, you're also going to have more cytokine production, chemokines, neutrophils are coming in, other type of uh, phagocytic cells. You're going to have uh, generation of pus, which is why you normally have that pus that forms there underneath the, the comedone. 
what you're going to find is that there's uh, kind of two, two main varieties. You can have uh, more non-inflammatory, or you can have open and closed comedones uh, versus the inflammatory. You're going to see more kind of uh, papulopustular or nodular lesions that can uh, develop there. And so depending on the type, if it's more inflammatory or not, our drug therapy is going to change a little bit, which we'll see in some of our flow charts in just a few minutes. Okay. Um, so again, looking at, say, like a normal uh, hair follicle, you can have this abnormal keratinization. That's where you get that microcomedone that forms. Um, along with the increased even production, that's where you have a closed comedone. Again, that's going to be a nice anaerobic environment where um, you're going to start to see um, uh, more of the, the bacteria start to, to develop there. And you're going to see either, uh, sometimes you have an open comedone that will form from this. Uh, sometimes you get these pustules, which will, you know, when they start to get um, more uh, you know, pus and things like that, they can develop these kind of pustules. Um, sometimes they'll develop in either nodule or cyst. And so again, when dealing with kind of the um kind of specifics of what type of acne you're dealing with the drug therapy is going to differ just a little bit as we'll see uh, moving forward and again um, nice picture kind of showing this so again you have your uh, hair follicle you have your nice sebaceous gland here um, once you start to have uh, say accumulation of shed keratin and sebum things like that you start to kind of block things up here and so you're going to have more of the bacteria forming um, so we're going to have more um, uh, inflammation starting to develop here and again it's more um, uh, inflammation just starts to mount up. That's where you're going to have more pus developing, and that's where you get, you know, your nice, um, nice infected hair follicle there. So, um, one of the big things to, to note is when you're evaluating a patient with acne, especially if it's kind of new onset, is you want to look at the uh, possibility of drug-induced acne, right? So, again, always try to uh, make note of, you know, where it's possible that some of this. Um, some of the health problems your, your patient may be dealing with is related back to the medications that they're taking. Because again, if I take a drug um, that is causing acne and then I have to take more drugs um, to treat that acne, it's really not good, right? If I can go back and kind of eliminate the initial uh, source, that's always gonna be the best thing for the patient, right? So either switching to a different type of drug or um, getting them off of the drug altogether may be the best for the patient. But some things we can see. So systemic corticosteroids. Um, we're gonna talk about these more as we get into our ENT sections and things like that, but things like prednisone, things like methylprednisolone, things like dexamethasone. Um, those are all going to lead to um, have a higher likelihood of acne developing, uh, especially just kind of pustular inflammation on the trunk. Um, and you typically see it with two to six weeks after initiation of therapy, right? Um, you won't typically see this hydrocortisone. We're going to talk about hydrocortisone uh, a little bit later on, but this is kind of like the wimpiest of all of the uh, steroids we're going to be using for our patients. Um, so you don't tend to see as much... Um, uh, Kind of the similar glucocorticoid effects because again you remember there's there's uh, as far as steroids go there's glucocorticoid effects and there's also what was the other side of it the kind of more effective fluid and things like that yeah the mineralic corticoid side right so um you're going to see that hydrocortisone has a, it's a little bit more on the, on the mineralic corticoid side um but it's pretty wimpy compared to a lot of these other steroids that we're dealing with so you don't see as much acne there. That can be one reason why uh, we may like to use hydrocortisone for a lot of our um, uh, dermatologic woes uh, versus a lot of the other steroids that we're going to be seeing uh, moving forward. And one of the things you can actually see uh, when you have corticosteroid-induced acne is that as soon as you withdraw the drug, you can actually end up seeing a kind of initial worsening of the acne because, um, again, we said the corticosteroids are uh, immunosuppressive. So when you take that away, all of a sudden the immune system kind of ramps back up start to attack all those bacteria that are starting to form there in the hair follicles, and that can actually lead it to be uh, more inflammatory, it can lead to be worse before it gets better. So that can be one thing to let your patients know that, hey, um, maybe either gradually taper off of the corticosteroids, which is usually a pretty good thing to do anyway, um, or um, you know, just let them know that, hey, it's gonna get worse before it gets better. Uh, other thing, anti-epileptics, do you guys know what we use anti-epileptics for? Yeah, seizures, right, so that's gonna come up. Uh, we'll see it with some of our seizure medications. Uh, tuberculostatics, do you guys know what that's used for? Right in the name, absolutely. So tuberculosis, so some of those drugs um, are going to be uh, potentially worsen, uh, cause worse in acne. And then lithium is another one. Anyone know what you use lithium for? Okay, so uh, bipolar disorder is going to be the, the big thing there. Um, always be careful if you're dealing with a patient that has like a lithium allergy and then they have like a valproic acid allergy and all these different things. You're just going to be a pretty unstable patient when you're dealing with them just because, you know, they've been through kind of the, the all their different bipolar meds. It can be... Mm -hmm difficult to treat patients. But lithium is going to be one of those things that can certainly cause um, increased risk for, for drug-induced acne. And again, um, those patients are typically not super um, good about um, compliance with their meds. And so that could just be one other reason why they might actually go off of their lithium in the first place. So that can be uh, kind of problematic. So anyway, um, so our uh, as far as treatment goes for acne, the goal is um, to realize that this is going to be a chronic uh, disease. Some people grow out of it, some people won't. It just depends on on kind of what their their factors are. Um, but typically, we're going to see that we're just going to require early aggressive treatment, 
So you start kind of hot and heavy initially, and then you're going to kind of scale back therapy uh, for more maintenance, right? So start with heavier drugs, maybe higher percentage uh, concentration drugs, and then as it get, kind of gets under control, then you can scale it back, and then you're just kind of more in a kind of preventative mode, kind of preventing new uh, flare-ups to occur. Um, we want to reduce the number and severity of the lesions we're having to develop here, um, and we also want to slow kind of progression of the signs and symptoms, right? So again, in a lot of cases with these disease states, as far as med therapy goes, um, we can't reverse or can't cure the disease, but we can certainly try to slow it down, prevent it from getting worse. Also want to limit some of the, kind of the duration. They're having these kind of uh, outbreaks, uh, limit the recurrence, and then hopefully prevent some long-term disfigurement, because especially some of the really severe acne can leave scarring behind, uh, and then avoid any kind of psychological suffering as well. So obviously uh, having acne as a kid, I'm sure most of you had it, um, you know, it's, it's not super fun. Um, a, lot of, a lot of issues, can, a lot of anxiety and stress and things like that. So if you can fix that for these patients, that can be uh, kind of a, a nice side effect. Okay. Um, so again, the, the target we're going to be shooting for here with our treatment is going to be this microcomedone. And so if we can eliminate that occlusion, you're going to be arresting that further cascade, right? So if you never have the follicle getting occluded in the first place, you never really have a good environment for this bacteria to grow. You don't have the inflammation. So that's kind of the, the big thing we want to target there. And we're using a mix of pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic therapy. I always try to make a point to note when non-pharmacologic therapy is going to be preferred or when you can use that as a, a starting point rather than just simply shooting to drugs, right? A lot of people say, hey, let's just give drugs, let's go and knock it out. But sometimes it's not always appropriate. So I'll kind of note where that's going to be the case. Um, a lot of times you're going to see we're going to target multiple mechanisms of action. So rather than just shooting for uh, something that affects sebum production, we can maybe do that and then also shoot for something that will deal with the, the bacteria and then something that will deal with that keratinization. So some drugs will have multiple mechanisms. Uh, we'll be able to attack different factors there. Sometimes we're going to use multiple drugs at the same time. And then again, that's going to help us to target this multiple pathogenic steps. And then what we'll see as far as the type of drugs we're going to use, because acne is one of those things where uh, even though it's a uh, dermatologic issue, you know, um, you can get away with more mild to moderate disease using topical therapy, but for more moderate to severe disease, more inflammatory disease, you tend to end up having to use systemic therapy. So these are typically oral medications you're going to be administering. Sometimes you use topical and oral at the same time, um, but we'll see in those cases when, when that's appropriate. Okay. So starting off with cleansing, um, we typically are going to see that um, surfactant systems, a lot of the soaps and things and cleansers that we use are going to be surfactant based. And that's uh, important because those help to disperse and remove a lot of the fats and oils from the, the skin surface. Um, and it's really important to try to balance uh, cleanliness versus uh, drying and irritation. Because obviously if someone kind of overdoes it, they use too harsh of a soap or they're, they're scrubbing too much, that can irritate the skin and that can lead um, uh, to more possibility for uh, some of those bacteria to start to produce and, and get that inflammation happening there. So again, that's one of those things where you gotta uh, make sure they're, they're being clean, but not too clean, right? It's one of those things where um, you don't want to have too much irritation of the skin. Um, soaps tend to not always be the best products uh, when dealing with acne. The reason why that is, is that once these are rinsed off, um, um, they don't really have any further active product that are there, right? Because again, that's how soaps are designed. You don't want to have a kind of soapy feeling the rest of the day, right? Uh, you want to wash that soap off when, when, when you apply water. Also, soaps tend to have a higher pH. They tend to be much more on the basic side of things. And so that can actually degrade some of the activity of other agents we're going to be looking at. And so it's important to uh, make sure that and when we educate patients for certain products, they need to space out when they're using their soap uh, and cleansing-based products versus when they're using the drug products because can, one can inactivate the other. And so um, also they tend to be less tolerable on the skin, especially more kind of harsh uh, detergents and soaps um, tend to be harsher. So it may not be good for some patients who have more kind of sensitive skin. Um, and again, we recommend not washing too frequently. Usually twice a day is generally good enough for most people to um, you know, make sure they're not having harboring an environment that's more likely to have you know, uh, bacteria develop. Um, topical therapy, the big um, kind of caveats here is it's only going to work where it's applied to. So again, um, if you have a patient who's very diffuse acne, say it's going all over the trunk, um, that can be very uh, difficult for them to apply a drug uh, to all over, right? And it can be um, not super uh, good for compliance sake and, and all of that. So in some cases, um, the more diffuse the disease is, the more likely you are to use systemic therapy because that's going to be a lot easier to treat um, kind of all over versus if it's a kind of more um, localized area. Like if it's just the face, you know, topical therapy may be just fine for those patients. Uh, the other big thing is that most of the drugs we're going to use are going to cause irritation, right? Um, it can lead to discontinuation if the patient has um, 
uh, you know, if it's, it's painful for them or if it's very uncomfortable, they may not want to use it because of that. Um, and so the things we can do to try to prevent that irritation is try to start uh, start low and go slow. So you want to use low concentration agents um, and gradually increase depending on how the patient tolerates it, right? Because again, a lot of these products we're going to use are going to cause drying of the skin. They can cause um, you know, scaling of the skin potentially. Um, and so you want to start really low concentration and gradually work your way up. Um, and then also we can consider using non-alcoholic solutions because we mentioned alcoholic solutions are going to be more drying, right? So we don't want to use those if we can uh, avoid them. So um, looking at our different um, classes of drugs, you can see how they are going to work on different um, pathogenic steps of acne. So for instance, we're looking at the abnormal keratinization of the follicle. Some of the things we're going to use include things like salicylic acid. Anyone know um, a drug product that is very similar to salicylic acid? Aspirin, yeah, absolutely. So aspirin is in the same category as salicylic acid. Um, look at benzoyl peroxide. This is going to be one of our first go-to over-the-counter, easy to acquire, easy to use kind of products that we'll look at. Um, we'll also look at topical retinoids. Anyone know what vitamin this is related to? Mm -hmm. Vitamin A, absolutely. And then uh, isotretinoin. Uh, anyone know the branding for that? Accutane, absolutely. So uh, isotretinoin is one that we're going to be looking at. Um, this is kind of one of our hardcore, like, nothing else is working, Accutane's probably going to get it. And so we'll look at some of the, the caveats there with using that drug. Um, as far as dealing with the actual uh, bacterial proliferation, we'll see the benzoyl peroxide is also going to be able to treat that. Um, we can also use topical or oral antibiotics. And so we're going to see that in a more kind of moderate, um, mild to moderate disease, you can use topical antibiotics. But in some cases, patients will be put on oral antibiotics in order to help treat more uh, diffuse disease. And then isotretinoin is also going to help with this. In some cases, if it's very severe inflammatory, um, uh, you have a lot of inflammatory cysts, sometimes we'll actually use intralesional corticosteroids. Uh, that is actually where you'll inject the corticosteroid directly into um, the lesion, and that can actually lead to um, kind of a local anti-inflammatory effect, which may be useful for your patients. Um, sometimes we use oral, oral corticosteroids, but obviously we already said that oral corticosteroids can cause worse than acne, so we'll see it's kind of a double-edged sword there. And then antibiotics can also help here, especially with the, the, antibiotic, uh, the, the bacterial aspect of it. And then looking at the abnormal sebum production, uh, we can use things like anti-androgens. Why would you use an anti-androgen? Because what do androgens typically do to the skin? Increase sebum production, they can cause more likelihood to see acne. So have you ever seen um, those patients who are um, utilizing, uh, say, like um, androgen androgenic steroids uh, for uh, bodybuilding purposes or for weightlifting purposes? Uh, one of the big things they always see is they get like the acne. Right, so it's, uh, acne that kind of develops there. A lot of it goes back to that sebum production because they have too much androgen around um, that can cause that. And again, that's similarly, what time period in a person's life do they typically start seeing acne develop? During puberty, right? So again, your hormones are kind of going crazy. You have a lot of androgen activity happening there. So again, that makes sense why we would see increased um, uh, risk of acne. Again, isotretinone is going to help with this, uh, antibiotics, corticosteroids, and sometimes estrogens can help as well. Because sometimes you'll see that some patients um, uh, being prescribed uh, oral contraceptives, that can actually help with their acne. Um, some people, it actually get worse. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but we'll see that uh, there may be one uh, route that can help with that sebum production. All right, so any questions from the first half? All right, so um, I had a few questions come up about like anti-androgens and, and estrogens. We're going to cover those a little bit more in detail as we move forward. So um, if you have questions about those then after we cover it, feel, feel free to, to pop your hand up. We can we can talk about that more detail there. Um, so again, uh, starting off, kind of the easiest thing to use, the cheapest, probably um, kind of the nicest, low effort, ease of uh, most likely to be effective kind of drug that we can start with for acne is going to be benzoyl peroxide. Uh, I'm sure, you know, uh, most people have tried using benzoyl peroxide at some point in their life um, uh, because, again, it is very cheap and easy to get a hold of. And again, it should be something that most patients get recommended uh, for the most part. So the mechanism here, we're going to see is working to penetrate the stratum corneum. Okay, so it goes in unchanged, uh, and then it gets converted over to benzoic acid. Okay, once it's in this more uh, acidic form, you're going to find that it has good activity against that P acnes. Right, so it's going to have antibiotic effects there, and then it's also going to have these nice peeling comedolytic effects. Um, so when I say that, what does that kind of mean? Kind of affects the, the, the keratinization process that's happening there. So it kind of helps to um, uh, break down those comedones from forming, kind of opens the pore back up and allows for oxygen to get there uh, to, to the site. So again, so it's kind of helping with the, the mm -hmm. bacterial proliferation, kind of helps to, you know, if you have any kind of stuff that's in there, pus or uh, the sebum, things like that, it can be expressed. Uh, and so it's going to help to, to, again, work on multiple mechanisms, again, being synergistic there um, and, and affecting different uh, pathogenic steps of, of acne developing.
And again, these typically have been, uh, tend to be more drying. And so you can see peeling of other skin, even healthy skin, that happens there. Because again, keratin, uh, it's going to be not only just working on the, uh, you know, their, the comedones, but it's going to be working on other uh, skin as well, affecting that keratin. So that's why you can see drying, uh, peeling that can happen there uh, with the skin. Typically, we're going to start at low concentrations because, again, um, this tends to be more irritating as you get to higher concentrations or if your patient tends to be a little bit more sensitive. Um, so we're going to start at 2.5% typically. And again, you can try just once daily. Uh, and then you're going to increase the strength and the frequency as is tolerated. So, again, it may not be 100% effective when you're just using it one time a day at this low concentration. But as a patient is tolerating it well, say, hey, I'm starting to do this a little bit better, maybe not perfect. Um, you can start to increase maybe twice a day or maybe using a higher percentage uh, that's available. Some of the higher percentage percentages tend to cross over into prescription only products and so that would be something to, to note there. Again, available OTC, which is nice. And then uh, you'll often find this being used in combination with some of our antibiotics. So there's going to be some certain specific um, topical products that will contain erythromycin, for instance. You guys remember what type of antibiotic that is? <coughs> The macrolide, right? So that's going to be um, used quite frequently topically. Um, clindamycin, um, which again didn't really fit into like a really good category necessarily, but that can also be used. And again, notice these are going to have good gram positive coverage, um, uh, some anaerobic coverage, specifically against that P acnes. And that's mainly the, the big uh, bacteria that we're really going for there. Other adverse reactions are to watch out for uh, can bleach the hair, right? So again, if you're dealing with a person who's having really acne uh, bad around the hairline, that may not be the best product for them, right? Uh, so again, usually people do not want their hair being bleached uh, unnecessarily, unless they're like really going for those like frosted tips or something like that, and that may be, <laughs> maybe what you're going for. Um, yeah, we've all made bad decisions in our, in our life, right? Um, it's going to also bleach the skin, or, I'm sorry, the, um, the clothes as well. So again, if it's something uh, that's going to be uh, touched by clothing um, or maybe have them apply it during a time where they're not going to have clothing or at least clothing they care about going to be uh, you know in contact with it so again this is usually like you know a before bedtime kind of thing uh, where they're you know doing their kind of evening cleansing and they can use a benzoyl peroxide uh, you know, especially if it's you know on the trunk something like that if you're using kind of a ratty t-shirt or something that you know you're not too worried about that but it's their nice clothes it can uh, lead to bleaching there and then the biggest thing we're going to see this with most of the acne treatments here you're going to see skin and mucous membrane irritation Right, so again, all of these are going to be dealing with that, um, you know, affecting that keratinization of the skin, even healthy skin. So you will see, especially with higher concentrations, with more frequently administered uh, benzoyl peroxide, you can see more irritation happening there. Question? Yes. So this is a spot treatment, and not necessarily just. Over the face, per se. You could use like over the face. Um, this is not something we're really worried about, uh, say, systemic absorption. There's really no issues with that necessarily. Um, but again, as you have larger and larger areas, say if I was trying to apply it all over the trunk, that can become a little bit more, um, uh, you know, cumbersome uh, to do, so so to speak. Um, so again, depending on your patient, depending on what they can tolerate, it may not be super useful for that. But this is good for, you know, covering the face. You know, you just apply a little bit to the, the hands, you know, put it all over, um, wherever it happens to be, you know, so you may need to give, you know, larger amounts in order to, to kind of cover the patient for, say, the full, the full month, so to speak. But again, it could be used just for spot treatment, so if the person was just having, you know, individual little uh, comedones forming, you could just apply it there, that would be effective as well. Um, other drugs are going to kind of fit into a similar category as benzoic acid. We have uh, azelic acid or azelex. Um, this is uh, uh, basically a dicarboxylic acid, a straight chain acid here. And we don't know the full mechanism of action, um, but it kind of works similarly to benzoyl peroxide, where it's going to have antimicrobial activity. So it's going to be able to affect uh, the, the P acnes there. It's also going to inhibit uh, a little bit the conversion of testosterone over to uh, dihydrotestosterone. And we said, which is more potent of an androgen, testosterone or, or uh, DHT? DHT 100% right. So DHT, so if it can help to prevent some of that conversion, now all of a sudden we have a little bit of local acting anti-androgen effects. And that may be very useful depending on the patient, uh, what their what their individual kind of pathology is, is that they're really kind of hyperandrogenic. Uh, this may be useful for those uh, those cases. Again, you're not going to see a ton of systemic effects here, which is, uh, which is good because it's going to be just locally applied. Again, this is one of the things we're going to start uh, just once daily. You can increase it twice daily depending on how they tolerate it. And again, the biggest interaction or drug, adverse drug reactions you're going to see is just you know some mild skin irritation and dryness developing there, very similar to the benzoic acid. Um, typically, you're going to see that patients tend to um, uh, kind of get over a lot of this irritation over time. They tend, the body tends to get used to it. So say like six to eight weeks of continuous therapy, they, they tend to um, uh, resolve a lot of that irritation that happens there. And also, you can see hypopigmentation of the skin. So that's kind of a unique thing with the zelic acid. Um, to where you can see the skin starting to get lighter. Uh, again, depending on where you're applying this to, that may be a problem, may not be. So especially um, they, you know, if it's on the face or something like that, it may be one thing you may not want to try there, so depending on the patient. 
And then moving on, we have our topical retinoids. So again, these, um, again, retinoic acids is going to be kind of the progenitor of this group. Um, again, another name for this would be tretinoin or retin A. Uh, this is the acidic form of vitamin A. Um, again, these are going to be um, uh, behind the counter, or I'm sorry, uh, prescription based products or kind of uh, exhausted, at least for these topical products, are, are over the counter um, uh, based agents. Uh, but these are going to be prescription only, uh, except when uh, one time me and my wife went on a cruise uh, to uh, Nassau and went to a local pharmacy just to kind of check out, see what, see what was going on there because we're nerds. Um, <laughs> My wife was very excited because they had uh, uh, retinoic acid uh, available OTC, so she ended up buying like four or five bottles of the stuff. I'm just like, uh, as you'll see, it also can be useful for uh, wrinkles and dispigmentation. So she was like, well, I can use it for my prevent wrinkles from happening, and then it's you know without any prescription is great. Um, huh? Yeah, they can be expensive. Yeah, depending on the product as well. So that, again, so if you ever go on a cruise and you want to pick up some wrinkle cream, that, that might be the place for it. <laughs> Also, it's like Tylenol number three available over the counter, which I thought was really weird. So we got some of that as well. Um, so <laughs> coding without a prescription, great. Um, all right, anywho. So again, uh, mechanism not fully understood as you're gonna see with a lot of these um, topical based products, um, but we believe it can kind of help with this abnormal follicular keratinization. So kind of help with that product. Again, this will have, again, appealing effects, a comedic kind of effects. Um, it's gonna help to reduce the P acnes count. So it can deal with the, the antibiotic or the, the bacterial issue. And then also will work to reduce inflammation. This typically is going to be first-line uh, therapy for non-inflammatory comedonal acne. So especially if kind of over-the-counter products have not been working for the patient, or if they come into you and say, "Hey, I've already tried this, and you know, benzoic acid is not working," this might be the next step to go for some of these patients. Okay, um, and again, for more inflammatory acne, you tend to see multiple agents being used. This may be uh, one of the ones you're going to use here. We're going to see there's other retinoin uh, uh, vitamin A-based products as we go forward here. This is kind of just the the, the most basic one we have. Uh, so um, adverse effects, you're going to see more kind of skin irritation with these um, uh, vitamin A-based products. So you can see erythema, uh, desquamation, so again, just kind of skin breakdown, uh, burning and stinging. This typically will uh, go away with time, gets better with time. Um, it can also use emollients. And so when I say emollient, what does that mean? Yeah, like a moisturizer, something that kind of help to uh, hydrate the skin. Um, so you think about things like your aquaphors or your um, eucerin creams, things like that. Um, they can help to hydrate the skin. That can be useful to help kind of preventing a lot of that irritation, burning, stinging that occurs with these agents. Um, the other big thing to warn your patients about. So again, if we're on our cruise uh, in Nassau, uh, and all of a sudden we are going to see uh, photosensitivity and potential for severe sunburn. So again, let your patients know if they're going to be using this product and they're going out to the sun, especially here in Florida, um, you know, put on extra sunscreen, maybe use a higher grade sunscreen than um, they would normally use. Um, because because they're going to be more photosensitive in those cases. And then, again, anytime you're messing with um, any kind of fat-soluble vitamin, you want to avoid that in pregnancy because um, that is going to have very negative effects on, on the fetus. So if your patient is potentially pregnant or going to become pregnant anytime soon, um, you do want to avoid using your retinoids. Okay? Um, and we'll see when we're using systemic retinoids, again, that's going to be even more important that we avoid those just because there's a small risk with topical products, even bigger risk with oral products. Um, now, tretinoin itself, again, this is the one we mentioned on the last slide. This is going to be photolabile. And when I say photolabile, what does that mean? Breaks down in light, right? So this is not something you want to apply during the daytime where the sun can break it down. Um, you're going to be applying this nightly, right? So that way you can um, have the kind of full effect of the drug. Again, another good patient education uh, point. So this would be good after they kind of use their typical cleansing routine. Um, they can apply this afterwards and that can be uh, useful there. Other big thing, benzoyl peroxide is going to inactivate tretinoin. So if I were to use these two together, um, one would uh, negate the effects of the other. So this may be one thing where I use maybe benzoyl peroxide in the morning. And they use uh, uh, tretinoin in, in the evening or something like that. So that way they need to space things out so that way one doesn't activate the other. So some other retinoids we have in this category include adapalene or differin. This one is stable in sunlight and also stable benzoyl peroxide. So you tend to see um, that, you know, if, uh, for instance, you know, if the patient is using multiple products, maybe this is a better one to go with. It tends to be less irritating to the skin as well, which is kind of another uh, benefit there. Um, we have tazerotene or tazerac. This is actually a third generation uh, retinoid uh, that can be used for acne. Sometimes you'll see these retinoids used for other conditions like psoriasis occasionally. So again, you may see used for other conditions. Um, and then you'll sometimes see this one being combined with, say, top steroids uh, can be useful for dealing with some um, uh, more inflammatory kind of conditions as you'll see. Um, we have allotretinoin. This is uh, panretin. This one is actually just used uh, for treatment of Kaposi sarcoma. Does anyone know what disease that you normally see that occur in? Yeah. 
HIV, AIDS, yeah. So this is kind of a late stage complication of AIDS patients. Um, Kaposi's sarcoma is a type of cancer. Um, sometimes you'll see uh, these topical retinoids and these more kind of heavy duty ones being used for those patients. Um, so I may uh, see that there. And then we have this uh, vexerotene. Um, this is actually used for T-cell lymphoma. So again, um, not going to be used for acne, uh, these, these last two, but just to kind of get you guys familiar with, if you see those, um, these are some of the other disease states you can potentially uh, use. Okay, and then looking at topical antibiotics for acne, um, what you tend to see is that the two main ones we're gonna to use uh, topically is gonna to include clindamycin. So for instance, we saw that uh, cleosin is the typical brand name for, for clindamycin. So we have cleosin T, probably means for uh, topical or transdermal. Um, this tends to be a preferred agent, mainly because we see um, continued um, sensitivity of the, of the bacteria to clindamycin. We haven't really lost that out as opposed to something like erythromycin, uh, which tends to be losing efficacy over time, just due to the fact that uh, as the bacteria develop resistance, uh, erythromycin tends to be the first one that takes a hit there. The benefit to using topical antibiotics is that you end up seeing lack of systemic side effects, right? So again, we, we're talking about with like erythromycin, like what's a possible side effect you can run into? So nausea, vomiting certainly uh, can occur with any kind of systemic antibiotic. What else? Yeah, QT prolongation could be one thing we worry about. Anything else? Hmm? It possibly, that's usually a high dose IV. So that's not something we'd really worry about necessary for like oral use. Per se. Um, think about like SIP inhibition, right? So remember SIP 3A4, we said our macrolides can inhibit that. All right, that is another thing we might worry about. So that's another benefit of using topical products here. Um, but you typically see these will be less effective than if we're using, say, oral products. We're going to see those little different antibiotics we're going to use in those cases. Um, clintonomycin, what's a big side effect I worry about? Yeah, C. diff is one of the big ones. So C. diff uh, risk with clintonomycin uh, is, is one of the, the biggest kind of associations you should make there. Okay, so when topical treatment isn't enough, so this is when, uh, say you've, you, you know, you've kind of gone through the gamut of your topical products, you've tried using, say, topical steroid, um, I'm sorry, topical uh, antibiotics and, and benzoyl peroxide or tretinoin, and it's not really working, or if you have kind of more moderate severe disease or it's very diffuse, this is when we can start to consider using uh, systemic therapy, okay? So typically, you try to hold off on systemic therapy as much as possible, and then when it comes to this point, this is when you can switch over. Um, so the, one of the big uh, guns we go here is going to be our systemic retinoids, and the biggest one we have is be isotretinoin, otherwise known as Accutane. Okay, this one typically comes effective in around one to three months or so. Uh, but one of the biggest things here is contraindicated. Notice it's all in capital letters. That's so for emphasis there because it's very, very much uh, um, contraindicated from pregnancy and breastfeeding. And actually, they even recommend that men who might uh, impregnate somebody they also use either protection or they actually be uh, uh, involved in this uh, I pledge program, which I'll talk about in a second here, because um, potential transference from uh, the male patient to the female during uh, conception uh, can be a, uh, a possibility there. You can possibly see teratogenesis, right? And said teratogenesis is what? Yeah, you can have uh, uh, damage done to the fetus. It may come out with uh, malformations, could lead to the demise of the fetus, um, lots of problems there. So um, this is why what we have, um, for certain drugs, we have what we call a RIMS program. RIMS just means a risk evaluation management uh, system. And so certain drugs that have very severe side effects associated with them or certain risks um, that are, you know, and the drug has a good use for uh, certain patients, but you really need to worry about these risks for certain side effects. In this case, tritogenesis kind of was the one that isotretinone got signed up for, um, is that we have a new system. It's called iPledge. Actually, it's not new. It's been around for a while. Um, but basically what this means is that it is a, a system where the provider has to be signed on. Uh, with the iPledge system. The pharmacy has to be signed on with the iPledge system and the patient. And so the goal here is that this way we have complete accountability for who is receiving isotretinoin. So only certain providers can do it, only certain pharmacies can dispense it, and then only certain patients who have shown that they are not pregnant uh, can receive the drug. So for instance, uh, and they also have to show they've received certain education about using um, you know, at least two forms of contraception, things like that. So typically, patients have to show they have like two negative pregnancy tests for female patients before they can even start the medication, you know, things like that. Once it's documented, then the system will allow them to uh, dispense the medication from the pharmacy. So it's pretty hardcore um, because we know that the, the risk for triadogenesis is so severe, we want to prevent that from occurring. And again, who are we giving, uh, who, who's most likely to receive treatment for acne with each bracket of patients? Teenagers, right? And teenagers, uh, do they always make great decisions? Actually, they make all bad decisions for the most part. And so um, because of that, you really worry about the risk for things like, you know, pregnancy, unplanned pregnancies. And so this is why we uh, have these kind of systems in place. So um, adverse reactions that go along with this is going to be very similar to what we saw with some of the other retinoids. Um, again, a lot of skin irritation, a lot of erythema, uh, pruritus, which is what is pruritus? Itching of the skin, we can see scaling, photophobia, so they can have, you know, kind of sensitivity to the light. Um, you can see arthralgias, which, what is that? 
joint yeah, joint aches, uh, headaches, alopecia can happen, brittle nails, because again, this is affecting vitamin A uh, all across the body, right? So that's why you can see eye effects, that's why you see uh, nail effects and skin effects here. Um, and so this is why, uh, this is one of the things we're going to be monitoring for uh, these side effects. And this is typically what causes patients to stop therapy altogether is because their skin gets so irritated, um, you know, they just, they don't really feel very well. Uh, that can be one of the problems. It tends to get better over time, but it can be one of those things where this may lead to premature discontinuation of therapy, which is why we usually hold this off until until we've kind of failed multiple other steps. Other things to note, interestingly enough, and we don't really have a good mechanism for this, but you need to monitor for developing signs of depression, right? Um, this is one of the things where we've seen an association between isotretinoin use and increased risk for uh, things like suicidal thoughts, you know, worsening depression. So you need to kind of uh, assess your patient and say, hey, how are you feeling? Are you feeling any different since you started the medication? Um, and if you have a suspicion, then you may need to either stop the drug or may need to look at some other, um, you know, kind of assessments for the patient to see is this something that's always been there, is it something that's newly developing? Um, because again, there could be a, a small risk there for increased you know, suicidal thoughts or ideations, things like that. So if, again, if you weren't uh, suicidal from the horrible acne you have, then yeah, now you have a drug to even worsen that, right? So again, sometimes we'll see that these uh, drugs can have very unintended side effects here. But um, other things we can use uh, systemically uh, for treating acne includes our systemic antibiotics. Again, this is going to be more for extensive or difficult to treat disease. Um, and so one of the go-to drugs we'll see here includes uh, tetracyclines. Right, so we can either use tetracycline, we can use doxycycline, minocycline is another in that category. Um, I probably see most often doxycycline is the most common one being used, uh, mainly because it comes on a lot of the uh, free or cheap drug list for things like Walmart or Publix. Um, and so this one gets used very, very frequently. Do you remember who we should not use doxycycline in? Less than eight years of age, uh, patient less than eight, or? Yeah, pregnancy, especially second and third trimester, kind of when you have most of the bones and, and, and uh, teeth and everything developing in, in the fetus. Right, so again, it's very, very uh, uh, safe to use, very, uh, very effective in a lot of cases, very inexpensive. So we use it in a lot of patients, but it's important to know which ones we do not want to use it in um, in order to make those, uh, you know, make sure we're using it appropriately. Again, remember that you can have um, uh, issues where the doxycycline will chelate calcium ions. Not only will it do that for um, you know, preventing some of the in inflammation that's happening there in the comedone, but it also will do that in the GI tract. So again, make sure they know that drug interaction where if they are consuming with iron or calcium, it can chelate that as well and prevent absorption. So one thing to note there. Um, occasionally, uh, you may use things like uh, trimethoprim or sulfacetamide or uh, Bactrim. Uh, I should actually say sulfamethoxazole. I'll correct that on the slide. Um, uh, azithromycin, and again, azithromycin and falls in what category? So, yeah, it's another macrolide, right? So that's uh, the most common oral macrolide we're going to be using there. And sometimes uh, ciprofloxacin. Cipro being what type of drug? Yeah, fluoroquinolone, right? So that's working on that DNA gyrase working there. Um, how does uh, trimethoprim and uh, sulfamethoxazole work, or sulfacetamide in this case? Yeah, so it prevents folate synthesis in, in the bacteria, right? So if they can't uh, uh, utilize folic acid, then they can't generate new DNA. They can't really have replication there. So again, uh, good keep it, uh, keep the mechanisms of action in mind. Kind of keep reviewing those as we as we go forward. Other things we can potentially use, um, uh, and again, this is going to be more for patients failing other forms of therapy. Um, we use things like uh, salicylic acid, which I mentioned is kind of a uh, very uh, uh, similar in structure to aspirin, uh, aspirin just being acetyl salicylic acid. Um, and again, this is used for a lot of years, um, but it's not routinely recommended anymore. But the big thing here is a uh, keratinolytic, which means it's going to help to break down that kind of abnormal uh, keratinization. Does anyone know what you normally use salicylic acid over the counter for these days? Warts, yeah. So again, very similar uh, keratin link actually we use for warts. So you can apply it directly to kind of br break down um, that tissue and hopefully get rid of the the, you know, the virus causing the warts there. Um, also thought to have some mild anti-inflammatory activity, kind of similar to the aspirin that we would normally take, say, orally. Uh, and we'll have some antimicrobial uh, properties there. Uh, just do kind of its acidic nature. So, so it may be used topically occasionally, but not usually recommended in a lot of the guidelines. Now, occasionally, um, we can use antiandrogens, which again will prevent um, either conversion of things like uh, testosterone to, to dihydrotestosterone, or will specifically block those androgenic receptors. So, in this case, you see things like spironolactone or aldactone. This is uh, an oral medication that we will typically more so use for things like congestive heart failure when we get to our cardiovascular section. And so, one of the big side effects you can see uh, for uh, spironolactone is actually gynecomastia. You guys know what that is? Yeah, abnormal breast tissue development. So you see that a lot in males. And so that's one of the big concerns with using antiandrogens is you can see more um, uh, feminization of male patients. That's something they would uh, be, you know, obviously can be troubling to them. Um, 
And again, you would see uh, potential risk if they are trying to get pregnant, right? So again, uh, anytime you're uh, dealing with uh, affecting hormones in a pregnant patient, that can lead to potential problems here. And this is uh, no different. Um, there is a gel that may be either available. Um, I'm not sure if there's one to purchase, but you can like uh, in some cases go to like compounding pharmacies where you can custom compound uh, products for you. And so you may see like a spironolactone gel. Again, more local effects uh, that may be beneficial um, in, in lacking some of those uh, systemic problems. And then uh, for oral contraceptives, these are useful in some women. You kind of find that kind of balances um, uh, the, their hormones out a little bit. Sometimes you'll see that, especially during certain times of the month, they may have spikes um, where they may have worse in acne than others. By giving contraceptives, you kind of balance things out you know, consistently throughout the month. Um, and so it can be useful in some women. Some women, um, you can actually find that uh, their, their acne gets worse. And so it just depends on, on their situation. Uh, the most common one we're going to see being used includes ethanol estradiol which is an estrogen product, and then uh, norethindrone, uh, norethindrone being uh, the, um, the kind of the progesterone component there. Uh, so it just depends on, on uh, what type of products we're going to use here. In some cases, you may find that uh, for some women, they tend to have more androgenic um, activities from some of these estrogens uh, based on the progesterone that we're using. And so when we talk about um, women's health stuff, uh, we'll talk about some of those that are going to be better for acne than others. Um, but just knew that is, that is one um, possibility that we can use as treatment for these patients. Okay. Um, other therapies, if they're failing kind of everything else, we can use potentially intralesional steroids. Um, so this can be very effective for kind of individual large inflammatory nodules. Um, you can see with repeated use or especially large doses, some systemic absorption, which again, we know that whenever we're giving exogenous steroids, that usually tells the adrenal gland, that, hey, we can shut down uh, production for a while. And so you can see adrenal suppression. So that can be one, one problem we'll see. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. In addition, you can see local tissue atrophy. So that can be kind of another unique side effect to, to doing that. Um, this is typically something like triamcinolone. Uh, again, I'm not gonna uh, quiz you super specific on this because it's not something I, I deal with very commonly. Um, but again, if you're working in dermatology, you may see this more, more, um, more commonplace. And then uh, in some cases we'll see oral corticosteroids. You can sometimes use low dose therapy. Um, they can actually reduce symptoms if you have a patient who's really kind of hyperadrenal in the first place. Um, so again, by giving exogenous corticosteroids, the, uh, we activate that negative feedback loop for the adrenal glands and say, hey, okay, we can stop production here for a while. And so by doing that, it kind of helps to um, decrease the, the overactivity of their adrenal gland in the first place. Uh, sometimes you do, I don't see that very commonly. Um, and in some cases, they have highly inflammatory disease. They can use kind of a short burst of steroids to try to tamp down the immune system uh, for a period of time. Hopefully, they can clear off the infection and then uh, the, the inflammation will be decreasing in general. Um, so things like prednisone or dexamethasone are probably the most common oral uh, glucocorticoids we may administer there. We'll talk more about these later and a lot of the side effects are associated with them, though. Okay, so basically... Um, you need to treat acne in kind of a stepwise approach. And so this is kind of a good table, um, kind of showing you uh, what the suggested um, treatments are gonna be for different stages of acne and then what kind of the follow-up um, you, you should have. And then if therapy fails, you know, what should you do next, right? And so again, a stepwise approach, um, it's important to consider like, okay, if you have a patient who's failed benzoyl peroxide, what's the next step? Or if they failed topical antibiotic, what's the next step here? And so you can see this table is very good for that. So kind of walking through it, and again, um, kind of broad generalities are the good things to pull from this, not every, every single word off this table. But say we're starting off with say type one acne, and we're gonna consider that mainly just comedones, uh, maybe some inflamed papules or pustules, no scarring presence. This is pretty pretty benign acne for the most part. And so what do you think, what type of therapy do you think would be most appropriate for that type of patient? So should I use systemic or topical? Topical. Okay, so what's something I can go with? Benzoyl peroxide. What else? Possible like, you know, um, uh, tretinoin, possible maybe topical antibiotics, probably not at this stage, right? Um, so again, you can see here that topical retinoid um, can uh, be used as a drug of choice, especially if they're coming into you and they've already failed over-the-counter therapies. Because um, again, most time, most patients are gonna self-treat before they come to you uh, for treatment here, right, in, in most cases. Um, so if they've already kind of failed a lot of the over-the-counter products, um, they can come to you. Tretinoin might be one of the best um, products to start with, a topical retinoid. Um, Again, you can also consider using things like benzoyl peroxide in combination with their retinoids. But again, keep in mind, you know, remember that uh, interaction between like tretinoin and benzoyl peroxide, one can activate the other. So maybe moving to something like dapolene instead might be a good option. So these are all kind of things to consider when prescribing drugs for your patients. 
again, you go ahead and continue until the lesions are you know, cleared up. Uh, and then as you as they start to clear, then you can kind of stop or then taper the therapy. So maybe, um, you know, you treat them with the, uh, the tretinoin. And then as they start to improve, then you can kind of scale back and maybe just using benzoyl peroxide, right? So again, the idea is to use the fewest number of drugs at the lowest concentration uh, as few times as possible a day in order to uh, make sure we're not dealing with a lot of skin irritation. Okay, but say that didn't work, say uh, after three months or so, our patient is still having worsened acne or it's not getting any better, then we kind of step up and we move more to like a type 2 treatment, okay? So this is where we have more comedones with like say numerous uh, papules, a lot of pustules, uh, and again, mostly facial in all these cases here. Um, now we can start to utilize things like topical retinoids plus benzoyl peroxide. So before it was more like, you know, single therapy, maybe combination. Now it's moving more towards primarily the combination therapy. And this is where we can start to see more um, topical antibiotics being used here. So think about things like topical erythromycin or topical clindamycin being uh, options here. And again, treat, check in three months, see how they're doing. Uh, if it's not getting any better, then you can kind of again step up therapy again. So now we're here to this more type three. This is where you're going to see more kind of diffuse acne, where it's kind of more uh, hitting the, the trunk, uh, hitting the back. Um, again, more diffuse, more difficult to treat, specifically just topical products. So this is when we can start to think about our systemic antibiotics, right? So this is where you might consider things like doxycycline, um, something like, you know, azithromycin, ciprofloxacin, those kind of options here, um, plus a topical retinoid, right? So again, depending on kind of the, the area you need to cover here, um, or they can use uh, potentially benzoyl peroxide. But the main thing here is just the systemic antibiotic. So this is, again, what a lot of people kind of jump to when you have more moderate to severe disease or very uh, um, uh, diffuse disease, this is where you can jump to the systemic antibiotics, okay? So again, uh, you try those, uh, you know, typically you prescribe them for say like daily use, uh, and then over four to six months or so, you kind of see how they're doing. You can try to taper off the antibiotics as possible, because obviously uh, the more antibiotic exposure the patient has, what, what are some risks they could have? Possible resistance, what else? Sometimes like, you know, you worry about things like C. diff possibly showing up there as a possibility. Sometimes you worry about things like, you know, uh, secondary fungal infections, if like thrush or something like that. So those are all, all possibilities you can see after using, uh, you know, uh, systemic antibiotics for a long period of time. So be consider, uh, consider of that. Try to taper them off as soon as you can, usually after four to six months or so, uh, kind of see where, how they're doing and try to taper. At this point, you can also consider something like either a contraceptive or an antiandrogen, typically for women only. Uh, in this case, that tends to have uh, the, kind of the greatest benefit here. Um, um, you know, anti-androgen, I haven't seen used too, too much for, uh, for men, but typically if you consider, you know, like a developing, uh, you know, guy going through puberty, like that's not usually the case where you want to use anti-androgens for them because they're still developing. So again, that may be more specialized, you know, talk to a dermatologist who may have a little bit more, um, uh, kind of opinions on those sort of things. And then, um, you know, if they're not, this continues to not work, this is when you can kind of jump to the oral isotretinoin, right? So again, uh, they have to be registered with the iPledge system, show they're not pregnant, all these different things. Um, and so basically, you know, if I was to say, have a test question and said, hey, you know, patient was, uh, you know, at home, they failed benzoyl peroxide, they came to us, you know, they, we gave them oral antibiotics and now it's failed. What's the next step that we could try? You know, and maybe have like, you know, say um, topical clindamycin, uh, intralesional steroids, isotretinoin, you would jump to say, well, isotretinoin is probably the next uh, step in our, our pathway, right? So kind of have an idea of the stepwise approach, how would you uh, treat those patients? And then finally, kind of the most severe type, uh, this is where you have a lot of large cysts, either on the face or the, uh, the neck, the upper trunk, things like that. If you have severe scarring, notice here we're going to be using systemic antibiotics plus topical retinoids uh, and benzoyl peroxide. And then again, if you have a female patient, possibly antiandrogens or oral contraceptives. And then again, you might be using oral uh, antibiotics, especially for more like kind of flare ups, uh, especially. Um, uh, so again, if they, you know, we're kind of riding for a while, have a flare up and give them a course of antibiotics. Uh, sometimes you'll have them have a prescription to hold on to just in case one uh, comes up so they don't have to have an extra visit. Uh, and again, or oral isotretinoin may be another option here as well. So typically you hold off on the oral isotretinoin as long as you can until everything else has kind of failed, including the systemic antibiotics, and then that's when you can initiate that. Make sense? This is kind of the known general flow, kind of, you know, because again, we always want to start off with the least invasive, least, um, uh, uh, least in the drugs that can cause side effects, you know, all these different probably the cheapest products as we can, and then kind of scale up depending on how they're responding here, all right? Okay, so that's it for acne. Moving on, uh, we'll talk a little bit about dermatitis. So uh, we know this is a pretty common skin disease. Uh, eczema is another name for this. And so I guess it's going to be a chronic disorder. And again, inflammation is going to be the name of the game here. So we see a lot of inflammation. We're going to be using anti-inflammatories as our kind of main way to treat this. Um, again, usually as you can see this is part of an atopic triad. So if you see like asthma, allergic rhinoconjunctivitis, conjunctivitis, this eczema, usually it's uh, going to be uh, kind of a similar constellation of symptoms you're going to be running into. 
And we're also going to be seeing the skin barrier uh, is going to be playing a major role here. And you know, some of the products, especially when you have patients who are really like paritic and they're having a lot of itching, um, what happens to the skin after they're kind of scratching it kind of constantly? Yeah, so you can see excoriation. What possibly can you see develop after that? You can see like infection happen there. So you can see like secondary um, bacterial infections like cellulitis, abscesses forming. So again, uh, these are all going to be things we're going to try to um, uh, treat this early and aggressively to deal with the inflammation. Then we're going to um, hopefully prevent some of these secondary effects. So how they should normally present a lot of pruritus, uh, rash uh, in areas. They're pretty typical of the disease. Uh, and you're going to see, um, you know, usually this is going to have a, a chronic um, kind of component to it. So it's not going to be something that just, uh, it would be, you know, kind of chronic, low-lying, and then having you know, flare-ups that occur at different times, usually some sort of family history. And other things you can uh, see, you know, possibly for a skin test, it'll show positive, you know, uh, measuring uh, serum IgE levels, things like that. You'll learn all about the diagnosis aspect of it um, in, in CMS. But our goals, uh, as far as therapy goes, we're going to be providing, hopefully, symptomatic relief, dealing with a lot of the itching and irritation they're uh, having. We'd like to identify and eliminate any triggers, right? So if there's something specific in their environment um, they can deal with, um, you know, sp uh, specifically, you know, they change um, to a different type of um, uh, detergent or something like that. If you can kind of key on those kind of really easy things, um, try to eliminate those if you can. And then we want to prevent future exacerbations. And then prevent any kind of side effects from the treatment, which we're going to see. Um, this is going to be one of the big things we're going to run into is side effects due to systemic absorption of these uh, steroids, as we're going to uh, see in just a second. And then if they develop any kind of secondary skin infections, we can treat those as well. So uh, looking at non-pharmacologic therapy, some of the things we can use for uh, these patients include, uh, especially children uh, who develop this, you know, just giving lukewarm baths or applying a lubricant after bathing, so something like a, a you know, a, a lotion or something like that to kind of help kind of hydrate the skin. Also keeping fingernails short, that's going to help to prevent you know, a lot of scratching and, and a lot of um, uh, damage to the skin there. And then sometimes we'll actually give sedating antihistamines. We'll talk about this in the ENT section, but this will include things like uh, Benadryl uh, or Doxalamine. We'll talk about those, in, but they're our first generation antihistamines we can use for them. Because uh, that way, um, not only is the antihistamine going to be sedating for them at nighttime, but it also helps to prevent a lot of the itching effects due to histamine release. Uh, try to avoid overheating. I think you distract a kid from um, you know, itching uh, constantly. Uh, Somebody have to put them in little mittens or something like that to prevent them from from scratching too much. Mm -hmm. And then if you can uh, identify and remove you know any allergens or any kind of obvious things, you can uh, take out of the environment. And obviously, just maintain good hydration. Better hydration, better hydrated skin tends to itch less. Okay, this is what we want to talk about. Let me get to the drugs. Um, so big thing here is topical corticosteroids are the gold standard. So we're going to be using corticosteroids as an anti-inflammatory to uh, deal with that kind of local inflammation that's happening uh, on the skin. Which agent we choose is going to depend on the severity and the site of disease. Now, did um, Dr. Nicholson cover uh, different potency of steroids? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of different scales that are out there, and so you're going to see kind of the general, uh, the specific classifications can change based on what you're looking at, but um, you'll see generally that, you know, the, the same high, super high potency agents are always going to fall in that same category. You're going to have lower potency agents. We'll, we'll look at those differences there. But um, basically what you're going to see is low potency steroids. Who are these uh, good for? These are good for the face. We do not want to use high potency steroids on thin skin areas because you're going to see more absorption. Um, so low potency steroids, good for the face, good for these interigenous areas, good for infants, right? Um, these are better for long-term therapies. So what you see is that typically for these patients, you're going to start with, a, uh, especially for a flare-up, start with a higher potency steroid, get that under control, and then you're going to scale back down to using low potency steroids. Okay, that's always the goal. Let's try to use the lowest potency steroid you can. Uh, medium potency you can uh, typically use like on the trunk and then on the rest of the body. And for exacerbations, this is where we're going to get to more high, medium to high potency steroids. Uh, and then typically use like one to two week kind of burst of therapy and then scale back to whatever they're on previously for kind of maintenance. So adverse effects is what I talk about this first because this is the, the main thing you're going to be running into. Um, they tend to be systemic in nature due to absorption of these agents, right? So depending on just the potency of the steroid, depending on the lipophilicity of the vehicle that it's in, all of that can lead us to have more absorption. Again, if you're also putting steroids into more thin skin areas, also leads to better absorption. So it typically is going to be uh, related to the potency of the agent, the duration that's in contact with the skin, the area of the body we're covering, and then the inclusiveness of the preparation. So I mentioned previously that things that have a higher oil content tend to be more occlusive. So this includes ointments, followed by creams, and then lotions probably the least occlusive out of the bunch, right? So again, as we increase water concentrations, tend to have um, less occlus uh, occlusiveness. Some of the effects we're going to be seeing just locally for the skin we're applying it to, you can see skin atrophy. 
You can see worsened acne or rosacea, and then possibly allergic dermatitis. This tends to be rare, but it's related back to the vehicle. This could be something where you can switch the product um, that they're utilizing, and then getting rid of a certain preservative or getting rid of a certain um, uh, inactive ingredient oftentimes is going to, to um, help to, to eliminate that, which is good. Because again, most people who are having this uh, have allergies to begin with, and people who are already allergic to one thing tend to be allergic to lots of things, uh, as, as it turns out. So um, the, which drug product they use specifically can be very important here. Systemically is where I'm uh, more concerned with these side effects include things like adrenal suppression, right? So I'm absorbing a lot of uh, uh, these steroids from the skin. It's going to tell my adrenal gland, hey, we have enough uh, corticosteroids floating around. We don't need to have any more production here, right? So it's going to shut down via that negative feedback loop. And now all of a sudden, if I stop my topical steroids, what's going to happen? Hmm? Not necessarily. But say, uh, so, I, so I inhibit my adrenal glands, and I stop. They won't know to kick back up right away. Yeah, I take, yeah, it takes time for your adrenal glands to really kick back in. So we call it an adrenal um, insufficiency or adrenal crisis, right? So that's one of those things. And then we see this more with um, kind of long-term oral corticosteroids that people will take. Um, but this is, can be an issue for these patients who are on this chronically as well. So if I'm giving a steroid chronically, I'm absorbing that through the skin to some degree, I can uh, inhibit my adrenal glands but it takes time for them to ramp back up. So I need to either titrate down or I need to uh, make sure that I'm applying that, that uh, steroid pretty consistently. Otherwise, if the patient stops all of a sudden, they can get themselves into big trouble. No corticosteroids floating around. Um, you can end up seeing problems with their blood pressure. They can have changes in mental status, all kinds of problems that happen uh, secondary to, to this. So that's really, really important to make sure they're taken consistently and that we potentially um, uh, titrate down slowly if need to. So we can get around that adrenal suppression by using um, uh, more low potency steroids, they tend to not really get absorbed as well. Um, and also by using lower concentrations, you avoid a lot of that uh, additionally, okay? Um, you can see secondary infections, because again, corticosteroids are going to be immunosuppressive. immunosuppressive, right? So you can end up seeing secondary infections. Um, hyperglycemia is another big thing. So if you have a diabetic patient, they tend to have uh, glucoses that are running higher anyway. Um, tend, uh, when you have more glucocorticoids being absorbed into the systemic circulation, that tends to have gluconeogenic effects on the liver, right? So that's going to kind of, because again, these are stress hormones. These are telling the liver, hey, we need to get more glucose in the system. So that's why you see their sugars right up higher. Um, you can see increases in intraocular pressure, right? So we'll talk about this in the ophthalmology section. We're talking about glaucoma that is a risk, um, increased risk for cataracts, and then potentially growth retardation in children, right? So you can have stunted growth due to um, giving uh, too many of these corticosteroids. So the goal is to use as low a dose as possible for as short a period as possible to prevent a lot of these secondary effects from happening here. Um, basically, you can end up seeing that um, corticosteroids have negative effects on uh, development of the bones, right? So that's why another one of those things we can potentially see as a, a systemic effect is you can see increased risk for like, osteoporosis um, and, and fractures for older patients. Same thing, it prevents um, bone uh, deposition uh, or calcium deposition in the bones uh, early on in life, and so you can see growth retardation happens there. Not that we, that's an absolute contraindication, but it's something to be concerned about. Okay, so looking at steroid potency chart, this is the uh, website I went ahead and got this one from. So I recently updated this. So actually, this is uh, one of the older ones that I was using there. Um, so basically, uh, you'll see that the kind of mild ones are going to be hydrocortisone, right? So hydrocortisone tends to be kind of the, the wimpiest antibiotic, or I'm sorry, uh, corticosteroid we can utilize for topical therapy, right? It also depends on the salt form that you're going to be using because you're going to see that certain hydrocortisone uh, formulations tend to have uh, higher potencies if you change it over to a different um, salt form, whether it's butyrate or valerate, which I'll, I'll show you in a few minutes here. Um, you'll see as you get into more moderate steroids, you think of the aclimatazone, clobetazone, uh, fluorocortisone, and then as you get into higher potency, um, the betamethasone, things like that. Um, again, here's an example. Hydrocortisone butyrate tends to have a higher potency, again, probably because it has either um, higher lipophilicity um, or better ability to, to get into the skin and have its anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, and as far as va very potent, clobetazole tends to be one of the most um, uh, potent ones that are out there. So again, I'm not going to ask you on a test uh, specifically, um, you know, which one of these is a potent corticosteroid um, you know, betamethasone versus clobetazole versus hydrocortisone. I'm not going to ask that specifically, but I will ask questions like, you know, what is one of the potential problems of using a potent steroid versus, uh, say, a mild steroid, right? Or what are the, the possible side effects we could see with that? Or, you know, the goal of therapy is to use very potent steroids. You say that's false, right? Because we're trying to use mild steroids whenever possible. But a good thing to just keep in mind, clobetazole tends to be very, very potent. Uh, hydrocortisone tends to be pretty mild for the most part. And then typically, most patients for kind of chronic therapy tend to go with hydrocortisone, okay? 
because again, it's going to have the least uh, amount of uh, systemic side effects we're going to be dealing with. It's going to be good for nice maintenance therapy. And as they get flare-ups, then you can start to bump up to something more moderate or potent, uh, depending on how severe the, the inflammation is. Does that make sense? Um, here, uh, I pulled this off of that psoriasis, um, that link, uh, pulled that off of there. So again, you can see here, just another way we can um, classify these. So here they have class one being super potent, potent upper mid strength. I'm sure Dr. Nicholson's, her chart looks a little different than mine does. Um, and again, I'm just putting these here for kind of your reference. Um, typically, when you're working out there, especially if you were to work in, um, say, dermatology, you're going to get very used to using, say, three or four or five of these maybe, right? And you get very used to using those, and that's kind of what's in your, your armamentarium and that's all you're going to ever use. Um, some of these are um, more kind of specialized uses, um, but again, in your general practice, you'll find a couple that you use, and that's kind of what you use uh, for good. Um, so again, I'm not going to have you memorize um, specifically which one of these classes they fall into, um, but again, hydrocortisone is a pretty good one to be familiar with as being a very mild steroid, because again, it's one that gets used most frequently. Um, some of these you're going to see being also used in other routes as well. So when we get to like talking about asthma, you'll see a lot of these gets used uh, for asthma for inhaled purposes, like mometasone comes up again. Um, triamcinolone is another good one. I see this used very frequently um, for um, IV purposes or especially like if you have a patient who has um, really bad um, intraarticular inflammation, like we see sometimes with rheumatoid arthritis. And sometimes I'll actually see intraarticular administration of triamcinolone. Um, so be aware you're going to see these again and again as we go into different disease states. Okay, there's the, the rest of them. So kind of getting to lower, mild strength, mild, and the least potent. So again, notice here that hydrocortisone is going to come in several different uh, percentages. And again, you want to try to use the lowest percentage you can in order to limit um, local and systemic side effects here. What's the yes. difference between a Kellogg and a Ristoport? I have On the previous slide? No, on, on uh, class three, there's... Triaminsalone, SNI, cream, and ointment, Aristocort. And then in class four, there's Triaminsalone, SNI, ointment, catalog. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so sometimes it deals with the formulation uh, that it's in. Sometimes it deals with the percentage of the drug um, that, that's there. So you can kind of see how they'll kind of bleed into different categories depending on the sort of things, which is why you see uh, hydrocortisone popping in a couple different categories based on the salt form uh, that's there. Right. And again, like if you put a gun to my head and you're like, which one's class four versus class five, I'd be like, I don't know. Because um, again, I don't deal with this every single day. Right. Um, so again, you're going to typically find that when you, especially if you work in a derm clinic, like the, that's your bread and butter. Right. So you're going to be doing this every single day. You're going to be very comfortable with um, whatever uh, that your group prescribes. And that's typically what you're going to use um, for the rest of your careers. Right. So it's one of those things where, again, um, we can't be experts in everything, unfortunately. Um, and again, this list is a little ridiculous if you ask me, which is why I don't like, I don't do derm stuff typically. <laughs> Just the way it is. Um, all right. Moving forward. So uh, other things we can potentially use for patients who are still having issues um, with their, uh, you know, atopic dermatitis and their eczema, uh, we can use topical immunomodulators. I say immunomodulators, what do you think that means? modulates the immune yeah so that's the safe answer absolutely um you're going to see it's going to help to uh, be typically immunosuppressive but these tend to be much more um focused in their mechanism than you'd see with a corticosteroid right corticosteroids are very broad reaching it's kind of like using a shotgun approach to dealing with inflammation these tend to be a little bit more specific so i have uh, two agents here i have uh, tacrolimus or protopic and i have uh, pemacrolimus or elidel and so these are going to help uh, be helpful with reducing the extent severity and of uh, the symptoms that they're having uh with with, with their eczema and then it works specifically by inhibiting the activation of T cells, mast cells and keratinocytes, right? So instead of uh, causing kind of global adrenal suppression, having all the effects you see with corticosteroids, this is more specifically working on uh, your T cells and mast cells and all that. Um, these typically are going to be second line agents after your topical steroids. So they're not improving with their topical steroids. It might be a fallback um, agents you can use. And um, you actually will see uh, tacrolimus being used some in, in some other disease states. Like if they have a patient who has a transplant, sometimes you'll see oral tacrolimus being used for, uh, to prevent uh, rejection of organs uh, being transplanted here. So again, these are very good immunomodulators, uh, not just for topical uh, purposes, but you can see it for other systemic uses, which we'll see later on. Um, but because of that, because it is immunosuppressive, uh, one, you can have a possible risk for patients with weakened immune systems. You can see risk for secondary infections. So imagine you had a cancer patient you were, who was on uh, treatment and they were neutropenic or say like an AIDS patient, um, you were to administer this, they have secondary risk for uh, say bacterial infection. So all of a sudden they get a cellulitis or an abscess um, after using these topically. 
And there also is some risk uh, for cancer. Uh, anytime you're kind of messing with the, the immune system in, in that regard, messing with T cells and things like that, there's a small uh, cancer risk. So again, this is why it's second line, and these typically are a lot more expensive than a lot of our uh, topical steroids are going to be. Can see uh, some burning sensation and some photosensitivity. So you want to make sure they're using high SPF sunscreen to make sure they're kind of uh, protecting their skin and preventing any kind of severe sunburns from, from occurring. Other therapies. Uh, occasionally for patients, if they, um, especially if they're more diffuse, very uh, severe inflammation, they can sometimes get away with using oral corticosteroids. And so these are used for short course, uh, uh, short courses, and then you would uh, taper them off and go back to using just topical products, right? This is just really during the exacerbations. They do provide the most rapid relief because again, they're getting systemically and they're working very well, um, but they're going to need tapering a uh, dose to prevent that flare up. So again, if I were to be giving um, a uh, oral corticosteroid, um, depressing the immune system, preventing inflammation. All of a sudden, I would draw it very quickly. You can see the immune system kind of flare back up. That's one of the things why we why we would taper these. Um, the other reason why we would taper is also to prevent uh, adrenal suppression or prevent that adrenal crisis. So again, if you have uh, oral corticosteroids that have been on, especially for greater than a week, um, you want to taper those off gradually in order to make sure the patient has time for their adrenal glands to kick back up production, so that way they can supply their own corticosteroids, right? And again, prednisone, uh, dexamethasone, methylprednisone, those are the most common ones you're going to see out there. And we've never seen like a Medrol dose pack, right? So how are those um, kind of designed? Yeah, it's a bunch of pills in it, right? So you have like one that says, says day one, you're going to start off with like six or seven, I can't remember how many are in there, uh, six or seven pills. And then you go into the next day, you're using one pill less, one pill less. So you're usually tapering off of like five to seven days uh, worth. And that way you're kind of building in that taper, you prevent that adrenal uh, insufficiency from occurring, right? So that's why you would see that potentially. Okay, uh, other topical antibiotics you may run into occasionally. Uh, bacitracin. Anyone ever have a scrape knee? A boo-boo, if you will? <laughs> bacitracin is a good drug for this, right? Uh, we mentioned this before. It's a good cell wall synthesis inhibitor. Um, ba basically, it's going to be able to kind of puncture a hole through um, those uh, bacterial cell wall, prevent, uh, cause lysis, and, and cause uh, death of the cell. Again, not very good for systemic use because it is very, very toxic. But if we can apply it topically, we can get very good local concentrations, kill off the bacteria, and it's very, very good for, uh, especially for preventing infections from occurring. We also don't see a lot of resistance to this because when you apply it topically, the concentrations are so high, it wipes out basically everything. Okay. Yes, ma'am. There is systemic toxicity, which is why we don't use this um, systemically. Right. So we only would apply this topically. Right. Okay, it's no. just a contradiction on this. Where is it? Uh, I just know. You do not see uh, systemic toxicity because it doesn't get absorbed. Okay. Yes, thank you for clarifying that for me. I just hadn't got to that part of the slide yet. Can you give me some time. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, thank you, thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, so you don't see systemic toxicity because we're not giving it systemically and because you don't see it be absorbed systemically. So even if I put on like a really large wound, the product is large enough that, because again, uh, wound areas tend to have better absorption of drugs typically, which is why you don't apply topical products over wounds unless it's specifically like an antibiotic like this because you don't want to see absorption, right? So that's the, the key point there. But good against all sorts of things like strep and staph, which, you know, would be growing on the skin. Good for anaerobic cocci that would be potentially getting into, um, you know, especially if you, like, you scrape your knee along the ground, all kinds of uh, anaerobic bugs there, things like tetanus, bacilli. Treats all of that, which is nice, which is why it's good for skin um, infections. Um, either use it alone or in combination. So you see, sometimes you see things like neomycin or polynixin. Uh, and again, neomycin, you guys remember what type of drug that is? Too much. It's actually uh, kind of a, an aminoglycoside that we don't really use um, uh, systemically very frequently, but sometimes you'll, we'll see some other topical products uh, and like otic products and things like that in a little bit. Um, but polymyxin B, so if you ever see like a triple antibiotic, like neosporin, that's usually a combination of polymyxin B, neomycin, and bacitracin. So you can use it by itself or in combination there. Again, um, you usually don't see any kind of like allergic dermatitis to this, but um, uh, so very few side effects, very well tolerated, very good kind of broad spectrum antibiotic for topical use. We also have mupiracin or Bactroban. This one is uh, uh, actually binds to bacterial tRNA and prevents protein synthesis. So another protein synthesis inhibitor. Um, this one is very good against um, treating most gram-positive aerobes, uh, especially MRSA. So this is the, the key place where we see Bactroban being used is MRSA, especially uh, for patients who are coming into the hospital who have nasal carriage of, of MRSA. So if you ever have a patient comes in, gets admitted, they get a um, uh, nasal swab, if they test positive for MRSA, they're going to get Bactroban. Uh, why, why do you think we would do that? They're coming in for, say, a CHF exacerbation, and we still swap their uh, swab their nose. Why would we do that for MRSA? 
Yeah, so it doesn't spread to other people, right? So that's one of the big things. That's one of the things we do to prevent uh, infection spreading to other patients in the hospitals by giving um, Bactroban. Again, not absorbed very well. Uh, sometimes can see some mucous membrane irritation, but other than that, it's uh, very well tolerated. And then polymyxin B, I just mentioned, uh, again, this is also going to be interrupting that cytosol uh, membrane. Um, very good against a lot of gram-negative uh, organisms, uh, which, again, is why we use it in combination with things like uh, bacitracin, um, because it has good um, local effects, not a lot of resistance that develops to this, and, again, not a uh, reason why we don't like to use it systemically, because it does have a lot of toxicity along, along with it. Um, it's some risk, though, if you use it on very large open areas or denuded skin or, or wound areas, um, you can't see risk for neuronephrotoxicity. Clinically, I never really see this really pop up, but if you uh, imagine if you're working like in a wound care clinic or working, say, like in a surgical IC, this may be more of a concern. Maybe just use something like bacitracin by itself. And then I mentioned immunoglycosides, neomycin probably being the most common one we're going to use topically. Um, occasionally gentamicin, um, you more often see gentamicin being used um, ophthalmically for babies as soon as they're born. Uh, kind of helps prevent some infections occurring from uh, you know, getting bacteria from the, the birth canal. But again, these are working on uh, protein synthesis, good activity against uh, primarily gram-negative organisms. Um, and again, if you were to give it systemically, you could see accumulation, which can lead to like renal toxicity. Um, ototoxicity. Um, the, the, the one thing I do want to point out here, which is important, is that neomycin frequently causes sensitization, right? So if someone's going to have an allergic reaction to a topical antibiotic, most likely going to be neomycin. So that's why if I give someone neosporin, which has a triple antibiotic, has neomycin, polymyxin B, and bacitracin, if they have an allergic reaction to it, it's probably the neomycin. Uh, so I can go ahead and, and cut that out and either use a double antibiotic, that's polymyxin and bacitracin, or just bacitracin by itself. Okay, um, I think I'm gonna go ahead and cut it there. So I have some more slides to go. So yeah, so we'll cut it here. Any questions before I let you guys go? All right, I will see you guys next time then.